Welcome back to Repackaged Wisdom. I'm your host, Paul Shirey, uh, former EIC of Jobo.com, uh, senior writer from Screen Rant, uh, former, and now independent journalist, uh, writer, artist, and podcaster. Uh, sometimes uh, act as a personal chef and Uber driver for my kids. Uh, here at Repackage Wisdom, uh, the goal is to talk to interesting people that have guided their lives and careers to success, navigating the troubled waters of this existence to pursue meaningful uh, and fulfilling lives while applying the many lessons uh, that have been passed on from generation to generation in the form of repackaged wisdom. A little story time. When I was 17... I was about 60 pounds overweight, which in 1995 was deemed fat, uh, for a myriad of reasons, not least of which was to get a girlfriend. Uh, I lost weight during my senior year, dropping about 55 pounds and making myself unrecognizable to most of my peers, uh, compounded by the fact that I was already kind of an outcast and nerd, uh, movie nerd and comic nerd, that is. I would have been a cool kid today and probably not deemed any, anywhere near as fat as it was back then. Uh, I lost the weight by running around a large dining table in my grandparents' basement uh, while also doing push-ups, sit-ups, and dumbbell curls with the one dumbbell <laughs> I happened to own. Uh, I also restricted myself to a thousand calorie a day diet, uh, which is not healthy, uh, but still worked. I stuck to the science of SECO, which is calories in versus calories out, and what do you know? Science worked. Trust the science. Since that time, almost 30 years later, I continue to work out to this day, uh, going through a number of different programs, lifestyles, diets, fads, ups and downs. I've had times where I looked amazing and times where I didn't. Uh, but the one constant is that I never, ever stopped, no matter how minor the effort. As a result of this lifestyle, uh, I decided early on that my children, when I had them, would never suffer a fate of being overweight and unhealthy. When my son was about 10, uh, I started making him go to the gym with me after already having enrolled him in karate for nearly five years, which eventually he quit. But still, it's five years of karate. Uh, I made it clear that there would be no choice in the matter. And sometimes I was dragging him, kicking and screaming to the gym. But then something happened. Rather than being dragged, he was wholeheartedly embracing it. And to my shock, decided that he loved it so much that he wanted to pursue it as a career. Well, I worked out and have worked with the likes of Rob Sulivar, Stephanie Campbell, Paul Sklar, uh, and used programs from Joe Manganiello and Dan, Don Saladino. Uh, I wasn't pursuing it as a competitive measure, just for fitness and to push myself and to change things up because, you know, sometimes it gets boring. And that's what you have to do. My son was venturing down this road, and so I have, in turn, been immersed in the lifestyle and ins and outs of professional bodybuilding. Now, you may have noticed um, an uptick in my sharing of content related to this uh, from attending Arnold Classic the last few years, as well as Mr. Olympia in the fall. While my passion rests in movies, comics, art, uh, and journalism, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, supporting my son's passion, much like uh, parents that, uh, such as my wife, uh, who supports my stepdaughter's journey in cheer. And I'm sure many of you support your children in whatever sport that they're involved in, and you kind of become involved in it just the same. Uh, I think it's kind of the natural course of things. Now, as a result of my son's passion, I knew that uh, my son, Dash, uh, who you've seen in the Arnold Classic videos, uh, would need a trainer that wasn't me. Uh, I am not a pro. He would need someone uh, that could shape him, mold him, and monitor him, very important part, as he develops. And we couldn't have been luckier than to find uh, find all of those qualities in IFBB pro Nate Joyner. Uh, we met Nate at our current gym, the Refinery here in Utah, an amazing gym, and it quickly became apparent that he was the right trainer for Dash. Uh, his positive, relaxed, down-to-earth, and passion-filled demeanor, coupled with an unrelenting push toward excellence, is inspiring. Uh, and upon my many conversations with him at the gym, it became apparent that he would make an excellent guest here on Repackaged Wisdom. Nate is not only a trainer, 
but also a competitor who recently attained his IFBB Pro status, which is sending him to Mr. Olympia in October to compete in the Men's Classic Physique Competition. He is one of 22 individuals competing. Out of a population of 7 billion, that's no small feat. Um, Nate will be flexing his muscles against the likes of current champ Chris Bumstead, as well as guys like Wesley Vissers, uh, Urs Kalasinski, and more. Uh, it is an esteemed group, to say the least. I wanted to talk to Nate about his journey into bodybuilding, how his background shaped him, the reality of the sport, as well as the wisdom he acquired and continues to apply to become a champion. Make sure to stick around after the interview for my own top five tips and tricks for a better fitness lifestyle and the things I apply regularly in order to maintain my motivation and passion for fitness. Uh, these are things that I live by, and I think it's a good, uh, a good way to close up this episode when you get to the end uh, to wrap things up. So make sure you check back in with that. Uh, one also quick note, as I was recording this episode, the camera on me uh, malfunctioned for about an hour of the conversation. So the audio may sound a little different, although still clear uh, for a little bit of this interview. So that's my fault for trusting in bad technology, but won't be an issue going forward as we've now fixed that. But just a little note for you in case some of you notice. And if you don't, cool. So without further ado, here is me talking to Nate Joyner. So Nate, first off, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, it is a Sunday uh, here in Utah, so uh, a very laid back kind of day uh, here in Utah, always on Sundays. So can't really do anything, uh, which kind of makes it easy and also pain in the ass. I love it, dude. I love it how it's like super chill on Sundays. You know, one's doing anything, you know? Yeah. Well, it's like the thing that always gets me is I'll be like, oh man, I really like go to Cubby's. Oh, Cubby's is close. Close, yeah. And I'll be like, well, we go to Chick fil A. Yeah, Chick fil A's, Chick -fil -A's close. close. And it's just like, and then it just snowballs until you're like, well, I guess we're going to fucking Del Taco. But I mean, if you got to do any kind of errors, though, the roads are a lot more empty. Yeah. Like, the that's places true. are a lot more empty, so it makes things easier. Costco on a Sunday is usually pretty chill. Yeah. So uh, I'll definitely take that. But yeah. It, it's, it's it's pros and cons. It's pros and cons for sure. Um, so Nate, uh, to start, I just want to get kind of a just a basic background from you, like where you're from, where you grew up, um, and just kind of a history of you know what led you on this path to bodybuilding. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, so I was born in Florida. Um, in part of Florida. Uh, what is it called? Day County. Like, so oh, my dad really? was in the military. Okay. Yeah, so my dad was in the military, and I was born, and he was stationed at Homestead when they had it in Florida. Hmm. Um, so I was born in 91, and, like, shortly after I was born, they had a huge Hurricane Andrew and just oh, yeah. wiped the whole place out. So we had to move, and we ended up getting, he ended up getting stationed in Illinois. That's where he's from, so we were at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. Oh, no way. So, yeah, I was in there for a little bit, and then, you know, moved to Hawaii. Um, and that's kind of, like, where I grew up was Hawaii. Um, and then from Where there, in Hawaii, which, uh, which Oahu. 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 Okay. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, I was pretty much grew up there and then, you know, just kind of got into the wrong crowd because eventually my, my parents split and then, you know, my dad moved to, I think it was Maryland, got in Maryland. My mom stayed in Hawaii and then we moved into, um, a, a city called Aliamanu. So it's probably like five minutes from my high school, but you know, a little bit more, I'm not going to say a rough neighborhood, but a little lower income, um. You know, especially with just me and my mom. So eventually I started just kind of hanging out with the wrong crowd, kind of getting into some bad things. And, um, yeah, it just kept getting worse and worse. And then, you know, I kind of had this come to Jesus moment. So after I graduated, got into the wrong crowd. Well, I was in the wrong crowd already, graduated, wasn't doing shit with my life, man. Just like going nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And eventually I had like a come to Jesus moment when I was, I think I was 19, 20. I was like, man, if I, if I don't change something, like I'm, I'm either going to go to jail, end up in jail, or I'm going to be dead. So, you know, I called my dad. I was like, hey, man. I still remember, like, I just remember vividly the day I did it, where I was at, everything I was doing. I was like, yeah, I want to join the military. Like, I need to get out of here. I need to do something with my life. I need to grow up and, like, straighten myself out. So, called him. He helped me out. That was, like, a seven, eight-month process to get in the military. Um, so, I lived, ended up moving to Maryland to stay with him while I was doing the whole process, just to kind of get out of that situation. And kind of, I don't know, clean myself up, I guess. And then, um, yeah, joined the military. 
um, October 2011 is when I joined the Air Force. Um, yeah, and then my basic training tech school, first base was uh, Germany. Nice. So that was a good time. Yeah, I spent all of Germany. <laughs> that was fun. What kind of sucks though is like I had just turned 21 when I graduated tech school. I was like, yeah, dude, you can go party, you can drink and stuff. Oh, yeah. And then go to Germany, the drinking age is 18. Yeah, so I was like, it doesn't even fucking matter. You know? <laughs> it was like I a, get away with nothing here. Yeah, it's like a bittersweet thing. But yeah, so Germany and then after that, well, it was in Germany, did one tour in Afghanistan um, in 2013, I think. 2013. Yes, in Germany. Kandahar. Oh, you went to Kandahar? Yeah, I was in Kandahar. Okay. Nice. Um, so that happened and then came back, got stationed at Hill over here in Utah. Um, in 2014, I got here and I've been here ever since and I ended up getting out in 2020. When? Whenever COVID hit, like right when COVID hit, that's when I got out of the military. Okay. So, so you did about, was it 10 years then? Yeah, 10 years active, 10 years? yeah. Okay. Yeah, same as me. 10 years was... Uh, it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> 10 years, uh, I mean, especially for my MOS, um, 11 Bravo, it's like... Infantry? Yeah, so like they're going to... Yeah. Regardless of where you're at at that point, they're, they're always looking for bodies. Yep. They're always looking for NCOs too to like yep. send... Hey, who could we send? Oh, we got this guy sitting here in this position. And I was like, do I want to play Russian roulette again for another decade? Yeah. You know, just to retire? I really didn't. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what it was for me. I was like, I, I'm not going to do it. It's rough, man. Like, um, you know, I wasn't infantry or anything, but I worked on the flight line, so I was a weapons loader. You know, it, Air Force gets this, uh, what's the word for I think of, like this title. I'm like, yeah, you guys don't do anything. You're not real military, stuff like that. <laughs> For the most part, yeah. Most of it's like admin jobs, like Air Force, like, uh, you know, we call them non-ers, people that don't work on the flight sure, right sure. or yeah. anything like that. But flight line work, man, you're working, you're busting your ass, you know, 12 hours a day sometimes. Yeah. You know, changing shifts, you know, day shift, go to swing shift, mid shift, and deploy quite a bit. So you're working, you're jobbing, man, pretty often. I was like, I was probably six years in, and I was like, dude, I don't want to fucking do this anymore, man. Yeah. Um, it takes it takes a toll. Bro, and- my, my mental health was just in the fucking shithole. Yeah, I was like, I, I, I was like, when I'd wake up and get in my car to go to work, like my mood instantly changed, and I was just like, fuck, man, like I hated it. I was miserable. I felt trapped, man. Yeah. So I was like, you know, I gotta get out. I gotta do something else. But you know how they always say to you, it's like, oh man, you're ten years in, you're halfway. Like, no, what's, yeah, exactly. What's ten more years? I'm like, what do you mean, ten years? <laughs> is a long time. It is. That's the thing. Yes. It's, you could say, wow, 10 years went by fast. Yeah. It's still 10 years. It's 10, 10 years, years being miserable, yeah. not doing what you want to do. And man, life's way too short to not pursue what you want to do and chase your passions and like do something you enjoy. Like it's not about the money. If I truly love what I'm doing, then I don't care how much money I'm making. I'm happy. Yeah. To me, that's the most important thing. So how can you be happy? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if you, I think one of the biggest problems with being in the military is that you can never break your your rhythm, your cycle. It's always the same thing. You know what I'm saying? It's Groundhog Day in many yes, ways. 100%. And you're just like, I gotta get it for PT again at mm-hmm. 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. I gotta do this for the rest of my fucking I know. Like the next 10 years, like, yes. no way, man. I'm, I don't wanna, I, it, it, it becomes too much. It is. You know, and you just, you can never break that cycle. You think about a normal job, normal whatever. So you, t- you tend to get in a decent rhythm, but you're not showing up for PT. Mm-hmm. You're not showing up with people that, you know, really don't know how to lead PT. 100%. Have no training. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it boggles my mind to this day, you know, because I was I was airborne and you know we would show up and it's like we're gonna run ten miles today and it's like that's all you got, man. Like you know you got a bunch of different people yeah. in a squad that all have different levels of fitness. Yeah. I think you're supposed to get everybody kind of to a baseline. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, this, this is the real truth about the military. Maybe not special forces and stuff like that. It's a little different. But when you're talking about line units, the people that are leading PT. You have had no training to do PT. Yeah. They went to basic training and they got, you know, went through the PT stuff that they do for, yeah. uh, for, for basic training. And that's it. They show up to the unit. And they're like, Hey, you're an NCO now. Go lead PT. And you're just, nobody's like, like oh, I don't know what the fuck they may say, Hey, turn in a plan for what you're going to do. Like, well, we're going to run and then we're going to go to the gym. And they're just like, okay, fine. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. But there is no oversight. No. There's no training. There's no like making sure that the people leading the physical training are actually qualified to do so. Yeah. Like, is it, like, what's the, what's the game plan? I mean, like, what's, what's the, the, what are you guys even trying to accomplish by doing this? There's no, there's no planning to it. Just run 10 miles. Like, what the fuck's that going to do? And that's, and exactly it. It's like, first off, 
I've been to combat twice. We, I never ran 10 miles. I'm saying, bro. Like, I'm not going to run for 10 miles. Like, 75 pounds of gears. Nobody's running 10 no, miles in that shit. No. You know? So it's like, what, what What are we accomplishing here? We're just hard. We're badasses, you know? It's so hard. 10 yeah. miles. Like, you goddamn right about the hard part. <laughs> this sucks. There's yeah. nothing fun about this, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, and that's just like, you know, silly shit like that. So I always find that interesting as we're, you know, we're talking about fitness and where you've gone to. How it's interesting in the military when I joined, I thought, man, I'm gonna join the military. I'm gonna get so fucking fit that yeah. it couldn't be further from the yeah, truth. No, dude. You know, in fact, I my know. my health, my health, mental and physical Bad. declined yeah. rapidly. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was just like shit. You know, this is absolutely not what I thought it would be. And you see the commercials. And yeah, like, man, these guys are fucking bad. These guys are superheroes, and it's like. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got firepower. You do, you, you know, you get some good training, you get some bad training, and you know, but most of that is with hardware. Yeah, and and you know, the things that you learn and how to use that hardware. Mm-hmm. But in terms of physical and mental health, that shit just declines. It was in the it's, trash, man. Yeah, like it's just like, especially you should see like the guys that on the flight line, like we get, they don't get time to eat, man. Like, yeah, they're literally just like, all right, dude, just go sit out at your spot and wait for your jet. Like, they don't come down for like two hours. Like, I don't give a shit. Go out there and wait. Yeah. So, like, these guys, these kids, they live out of the snack bar. Like, their lunch is, yeah. like, fucking Little Debbie cakes and monsters <laughs> and sodas. I'm like, I would exactly. see all these crew chiefs and, like, weapons and guys. I'm like, dude, you guys are disgusting. How do you not feel like absolute dog shit? You know, none of you guys work out. You guys literally work. I mean, I get it. They're getting worked into the ground. They don't have a choice. Like, they have to do what they're told. But it's like, you guys, you're so unhealthy. It's yeah. disgusting. It's gross. It's awful. So, yeah, like the military um, fitness regimen stuff was honestly was a wake up call to me. Like basic training is hard as fuck. Mm -hmm. I I can't lie like about that. And, you know, airborne school was its own thing. Mm -hmm. We were running five miles every morning and then running everywhere that we went. Every every uh, training thing that we had to do, you run to it. Mm -hmm. There's no like, hey, we're every now and again, we march, but most of you run it. Yeah. Um, and it was it was kind of fascinating to me. I keep straight from basic training, so I was yeah, making a split. Yeah. Then you have people that were coming from a unit, you know, and had been in for you know a couple of years or whatever, showing up, and they're like having to run five miles every morning. And every morning after the run, they line us up in formation, make everybody close their eyes, and they say, "Okay, this is your your moment of amnesty. If you want to quit, step forward. And then nobody will see. Nobody will know. And I, I will take you out every morning. You heard footsteps walking up. Step forward. And it's it was crazy. just like, damn. You know? <laughs> like, I was there and I was like, bro, yeah. ain't no fucking way I'm going to quit airport school. No, man, like, I will suffer. But like for me, I was like, the runs suck if they weren't hard. Yeah. You know, so that was, you know, it was kind of a blessing in that way. Like coming straight from, the, from, from basic training. You were kind of primed and ready, you know. Yeah, least. exactly. Uh, you're in Hawaii, then you come and join the Air Force. Did you choose the Air Force because your father was in it or what was, what was like? Pretty much, yeah. My my dad was in the Air Force, and my mom always tried to push me to join the Air Force because you know, like everyone always says, like you know, if you just if you want it easy or not easy, but like Air Force is the best way to go. Yeah, I guess you get treated the best, quality of life is better, stuff like that. Um, so that was pretty one of the main. But the main reason was my dad was already in the Air Force, so I yeah. kind of knew. Sure, sure. The world a little bit, so that just made the easy choice. But yeah, Air Force. Um. So. As you're growing up in you know, all these different places, um, was there ever a time in that period where like bodybuilding was something that kind of entered your mind and you're like, yeah, it might be something I want to do? Or when did that kind of enter your brain? You're like, this is something I might want to do. Okay. Um, so my dad ended up going TDY to Italy for like four months. I forget how old I was. I was relatively young. And he kind of got into bodybuilding when he was there. He got pretty, he put on some size. So when he got back, he ended up buying like a, you know, all in one like lifting thing, like a, oh, like yeah. a lap pull down, bench press. Got, you can attach it as like a leg yeah. extension, you know, a little curl bar and some weights. And we had nowhere to put it in the house. So we put it in my room. You know, I'm like <laughs> fucking nine years old. I don't know how old I'm. Young. So I'm just like, so I would just work out, you know, every day just doing random stuff. Nothing crazy. You know, I would just do it and mess around with it. So that's kind of how I started, got into working out. Um, and then after that, I started playing football my sophomore year, sophomore year, got into football in high school. That's when my dad really kind of turned it up and got me into the gym, working out with him. Um, and then ended up stopped playing football. You know, that's when I got into like the 
Wrong crowd thing. And then after that, obviously doing the military. Military got me more into the gym. And I got really into working out when I was at tech school. And there's not really much to do when you're at your... So tech school is like your, your place where you learn how to do your job. Yeah. Um, and then mine was in northern Texas in Wichita Falls. There's not a damn thing to do there. <laughs> it's just like desolate. This sucks, dude. So I really got into, I really got into working out there. Um, still not like super, super into it. Just kind of, you know, did a little bit of research. Tried to like lose weight, get shredded, all that stuff. Put on some size. Um, and just kind of followed that all the way through when I was in Germany. Well, and then when I got to Germany, I got into CrossFit. So CrossFit, oh, okay. I started doing CrossFit for a bit, for like probably a year. And then, you know, got back from my deployment. And then all my friends started PCS and everyone starts to dip out and start going your separate ways. And I was like, you know what, man, I think I want to change my job. So that is when my pursuit to join the Air Force Special Operations began. Oh, so okay. I was trying to become a combat controller. Okay. So it's going to be like you guys' version of like special yeah, forces. I, I worked with them. We had yeah. two, we had two, got two of them with us. Went out on patrol all the time. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, was, I, I wanted to become a combat controller. So I started, I was doing CrossFit already. So I started training more towards that more functional stuff. And then sure. I got to, when I got to Utah, then I really picked it up and I started doing my research. I'm like, oh shit, right. These guys got to swim. You got to do this. You got to do that. So all right. So I got to learn how to swim. I got to learn, I got to learn the water confidence stuff. I got to learn rucking. I got to do this. So shit, no joke. that was a long journey, man. That was like a two year <laughs> journey of me trying to teach myself how to teach myself how to swim for like, you know, I could swim, I could float and all that stuff, but like swimming for distance and time was a whole new beast for me. Yeah. So luckily at Hill, they have a pool, like an indoor pool. And I was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, see where I'm at, like a baseline, you know, got in that fucking pool, did one 25 meter lap and I was absolutely <laughs> gassed. I was like, Rob, I remember it. I was sitting there at the end of the pool. I was like, man. I was like, I feel really hopeless right now. Yeah. I have no idea how this is going to work or how long it's going to take. But if I keep showing up and trying, eventually I will get better at it. Yeah. That's yeah. all I kept telling myself. So I'd go to the gym in the morning before work or I'd go to the pool at like 4, 4.30 in the morning, jump in that pool not knowing what the hell I'm doing. And just, I feel like I was making an ass of myself. <laughs> like, just, <laughs> just like splash. Yeah, it. man. <gasps> and no clue what I was doing. So that was that. Eventually... Got better and better at it. And then I ended up meeting a good friend of mine. Uh, his name was Juan Mendez. And he was also trying to cross train to combat control. We both were uh, weapons troops. We both worked on the flight line. And luckily, we also had like a special operations liaison at Hiller Force Base. His name was uh, Tech Sergeant Hal uh, Houghton, Dan Houghton. And he was a pararescue man. Uh, he was no longer like, I guess, an active pararescue man. He was still a pararescue man, but he got into a really bad helicopter crash. And... He wasn't able to like do his, you know, his right. rescue and stuff. So he would train us, you know, he would hold like little uh, training sessions like once a month or like twice a month. And he would kind of do the whole like, so our entry level fitness for, for combat control or special operations is called the pass test. So it's like, uh, it's two underwater swims, two 25 meter underwater swims with like a minute in between or something like that. And then after that, you get about a good little break and do a 500 meter swim for time. And after that, you get 30 minutes to rest. You do a mile and a half run for time, and then two minutes of push ups, two minutes of sit ups, and two minutes of pull ups. Right. So that was just the baseline, you know, and then that's fucking hard for 90% of people. Um, and I'm not the best swimmer, I'm like negative buoyant. So swimming in the pool was just a really big challenge for me. But I think I'm kind of rambling now. But when I met up with Juan Mendez and started Houghton, that's when I really kicked it into gear and it started really clicking with me because for the longest time, like I could not get past, you know, how, like in a pool, it's like shallow and yeah. then it has that like drop off the ramp. Yeah. There's like a line there that drops yeah. out the deep end for the longest time. when I was in my underwater is like, I would get to that line and I just could not fucking, I would, I would, I would surface. Like, dude, I can't do it. Yeah. Like you would pick me out. Thing. Yeah. It was like a monster dude. Like yeah. I just couldn't do it. And then, you know, eventually Mendez was like, look, man, it's like, you have to conquer that thing. Yeah. It's like every time you see that thing, you have to just fucking conquer it. What's going to happen? Yeah. If you're around it, just go down there. And if you start running out of your surface, you're fine. You're not going to die. Yeah. And I was like, you have to stop letting that thing beat you. It says it gives you anxiety. Like your anxiety is literally crushing you and preventing you from doing this. So that really, that really struck a nerve with me and really hit me. And I was like, you know, you're fucking right, dude. I need to stop. You know, stop being a little bitch. Like man up and just do what you got to do. So that's when things really started turning up for me and I really kind of conquered my mind and started building that mental toughness and like that grit. And I was like, you can just do it. All you gotta do is do it. And then I kind of just came to this uh, conclusion of like, look, man, 
if you really want this that bad, which I did, like I was fully convinced this is what I was going to do with my life. Like I was going to get to this career field, do this for as long as I could. And then, you know, do something else after that. But I was like, if you really want to do this, like you need to be content, like, okay, with die. If you die, you die, dude. Like whatever. Yeah, it might sound sadistic, but like, that's just kind of what I told myself. And it helped me just kind of push through things. And, you know, that's one thing, like I said, when things really started clicking for me and nothing scared me. And, you know, yeah, shit was like you said, like your 10 mile, your 10 mile runs. Yeah, they were hard. They sucked, but like, you can do it. So that's basically what it was. Like, yeah, everything we did it fucking sucked, but like nothing ever broke me mentally. I was like, man, this really sucks. Actually, I would start doing shit just because it was hard. There was no physical benefit to it. Like, it'd be, it'd be like, it'd be like in the afternoon, like pouring down rain. I'm like, I'm going to go for a run. Yeah. There's no benefit to it, but like, it just sucked. And I would do it because it sucked and it would build mental toughness in that grit. I'm like, dude, you can do anything you want. Yeah, I think the, those challenges, when I mean, you put yourself in a position of something that's above and beyond what a normal person would do. Yeah. I feel like that does enhance that mindset. And I, in many ways, I feel like you do need that, especially for the military. 100%. Like you got to be able to say, you know, you, you, you got to be able to do what you're told ultimately without an argument. Yeah. You know, especially, you know, say, hey, we're going to do this and that's happening. Yeah. It's not a, this isn't a fucking, a conversation we're going to have about it. Mm-hmm. We're not going to vote on it. It's not a debate. You're going to yeah. do it. You know, yeah. like. There's times that there's so many times, but I mean, I always tell Dash this story too. I'm like, man, there's times where I was in I was in Afghanistan in particular. We we'd be rucking on a patrol through the mountains, and I remember I even have pictures of it too, where we get to the top, and I'm looking at the top layer of clouds, That's crazy. and I'm like, we have no climbing gear, <laughs> got body armor, we're yeah. carrying all this shit in our rucks, and I'm like, I remember sitting there just looking out, thinking. Oh, did we get up here? <laughs> like for real? How did we get up here? We are this high. Like, like do we need oxygen? Yeah, like, like seven thousand feet elevation. How are we <laughs> here? <laughs> just, you know, there's like, and but the thing is, the fact that I stopped to even think, like, how did we get here? Mm-hmm. There was never a point where I was like debating with my command. Like, yeah. Hey, I'm not doing this. Yeah. Why are we doing this? this we is, just did it. It was like, hey, we're gonna go there. Yeah. And we're like, all right, all right, fuck copy this. that. Dude. Go, we'll fuck, let's go. You know, you did, I, I, and I can't think of a time, maybe it's not such a good thing, but I can't think of a time where anybody questioned, mm-hmm. you know, what we were supposed to do or, or be told that we were just like, fuck, we climbed the mountain faces, you know, and mm-hmm. then in Iraq, you know, you're driving everywhere and it's like, just like, you're driving over a spot where you know IEDs have been yeah, how tell us times, everybody's just like, Pucker up. All right, guys, get ready. Here what we happened? go. It's like, wait, you know, it's like, no, no, stop the car. I'm not going. It's like, that's like, are you serious? Really going to do this? <laughs> We're just going. And you're just like, just hoping. Uh, okay, Lovely. cool. Good. All right. We made it to yeah, this. Man. So, but that absolutely affects your, your mental state. 100%. Because you know, you're like, you put yourself in these positions um, that, again, no normal person would be like, yeah, okay, let's go. And yeah. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like me today, if you told me, hey, we're, I'm like, what? Yeah. Now they have a choice. So yeah. like, eh, 100%. Look. That mentality is gone. I can't do that anymore, dude. Yeah. But before, it's like, you look at it as like a challenge. We're like, hey, we're, like you said, we're going to that mountaintop right there. Yeah. It's like, all right, let's fucking go. It was never like, wait, why are we doing this? I'll come into this. But exactly. Yeah. So like you said, it's good to have that where you don't question it. But there's, there's there's circumstances where, you know, you you should question some things. You know? Absolutely. Like if it's, if it's, Absolutely. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, you should be able to trust who's telling you to do these yeah. things where it's like, you know, I'll follow you anywhere you tell me to go. Absolutely. I trust you. So you see, we're going here. We're going to do this. Like fucking, you won't hear the argument from me. Like, I got your back. Let's go. Well, that's, and that's ultimately, it's the big game, right? Like yeah. say, it, to use it like a football analogy. I mean, train, you know, you play all the games up leading up to the Super Bowl. Yeah. It's like, hey, this is the game. Yeah. This isn't the time where we question things. 100%. This isn't the time where we like learn how to how to do a play. Mm-hmm. This is where we execute. Yeah. You know, and I think we've done it. That kind of stuff translates very easily into the bodybuilding world, mm-hmm. you know, and into the into the fitness world in general. Is that you know you have to develop a mindset where you're like, this sucks right now, but I've got to I got to build this. You know, yeah. Some people call it muscle memory, whatever the case. But you got to push your muscles, you got to push your body, you got to push. If you don't, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to so, learn. You're not going to build those those kind of tools that are going to push you when you need to push. Because you know? so, you're going to be like, this sucks, I'm leaving. Yeah. You know? And it's like, that's what you shit if I have that option in the military. Like, no, I'm out. Yeah. But it's like, no, I, I got to figure out a way to deal with this. 100%, man. Like, so, it's, it's like, 
like we're saying too, he's like training the mind, dude. Like your body will go as long as it, as long as your mind tells it to. Like this is where your this is where everybody quits, dude. Like it's in the head. Like yeah. your body will fucking endure anything, pretty much. Yeah. Because like if you're weak mentally, like you just shit out of luck, man. Like you're just gonna get you nowhere in life if you have a weak mentality, like a victim, woe is me mentality. It's like you are gonna get absolutely nowhere in life. So like building that mental toughness. So also what's funny too is like you know when David, David you know David Goggins, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 2014, I think 2015 is when we started kicking out on the scene. Like we started blowing up. Yeah. And like he was a huge like motivator for me. Like I watch his videos all the time. I'm like fuck yeah, dude, I'm gonna I'm gonna go run 10 miles just be, just for the hell of it. That motherfucker's yeah. crazy. I read He's both insane. of his books. Uh, we actually listened to his newest book. Uh, I'll drive here from mm-hmm. Alaska to here, and it was like the second book is pretty much just the torture that he puts himself yes through. and i would do that i would do stuff like yeah. that because i was like it's only gonna make me better he's like yes it sucks and it's uncomfortable but like me doing this to myself and i'm getting put into an uncomfortable position it's gonna make it 10 times easier yeah. i'm already expecting this like oh that's nothing i, I did something just to start not too long ago like yeah. you have to build that mental toughness so but all right so long story short i trained for special operations and then i finally applied for the retraining so for that, you have to apply for it, and they give you like a a day for an assessment course. So basically, it's a tryout. So if you're trying to retrain and you're already active duty, right. like all right, we want to make sure you're worth the time and the money. So we're going to send you down to Florida and Herbo Field um, for like a week long assessment course. So I think we started with like 20 people there. You know, first day there, you get there. First thing they do is the pass test to see if like you prepared and you're actually able to meet the bare minimum physical standards to do it. Right. Do the pass test. Everyone passes that. And then they put us in like five hours of like testing. Like, like book testing? Like, no, like uh, like weird questions, like personality uh, testing. Oh, okay. Bro, it was, they asked the weirdest questions, man. Like, just, <laughs> what the fuck's this going to do with anything? Like, oh, do you like poetry? Do you like plays? Do you like to watch movies? <laughs> five hours of that, dude, right? Wow. Yeah, I'm sure that's what it is. Too. Yeah. Like, they just see how much you could Bro, handle. they put a lot into it of like who they want to like select and put their time and effort into so that we got done with that and then for the rest of the week it was like water confidence training um just like certain events leadership training like just these things the situations they put you in to see how you'd handle it because as a as a retrainee you know a lot of us are going to be either senior airmen or staff sergeants e4s or e5s yeah you know and then you're going to be with these brand new kids out of basic training and tech school they're, they're going to be looking up to you. You're going to be looked up to as like the leader. You know what I mean? You're going to be the one in charge of everybody. So they have to make sure you're solid and you possess the skills they're looking for to, to lead these new airmen. So the water confidence training, that was a place where we lost a lot of people. Yeah. So like I said, I think we started with 20 and then um, the water confidence training was where we lost a lot of people. And what was crazy was like, I was the last person to finish my time swim. I was the last person to finish. Some of these guys finished their 500 meters swim in like seven, eight minutes. I'm like, oh, wow. fuck, dude. It took me like 11 minutes, man. <laughs> that was the last one to go. But those guys that finished that fast, like the studs in the pool, they were like the first ones to quit when it came to like the buddy breathing, the underwaters, mm. um, just like the things they'd make you do. And like, I still remember too, they pulled us out of the pool after some things. And like, all right, guys, they gave us these two like bands. Like, all right, fucking wrap your hands, tie your hands together and tie your feet together and tie your hands behind your back. So we're like, fuck, this. we're all sitting at the edge of the pool with our hands tied behind our back and our feet tied together. Like, right, oh, when we give you a go, go ahead and jump in the deep end. It's like, fuck, dude. Yeah, so you jump in the pool, you bob, they call it bobbing. Yeah, bob for like yeah, two yeah. minutes. And after the bobbing, you have to like float. So basically, you just kind of sit there like a turtle. Like, you come up for air, and you just float at the top of the surface. Right. And like I said, I'm negative buoyant, so I would seat to like the middle. Oh. So I'd have to like kick myself up, get some breaths. And like, I was just, that part was kicking my ass. So I became hypoxic because I wasn't like doing my breathing properly. Oh, yeah. So after that, like, all right, now you got to like dolphin swim down the pool and back, which that also kicked my ass. And then after that, and the buddy breathing, that's where I was like, fuck, this is kind of scary. So buddy breathing, no, do you, do you know, are you familiar with that? Oh. So buddy breathing is you'll be in the deep end of the pool and you're going to like, you know, lock arms with like your partner. And you're gonna share a snorkel. Oh, so, green. He takes a breath, blows it, blows the water out, takes a breath, and just pass it back and forth. And the whole time you have an instructor in the pool just kicking your guys' ass. You know, fucking flooding your flooding your snorkel, plugging it, pushing water in your nose, like grabbing your guys' heads, smashing them together, like gator rolling you in the water. 
And then, like, after you finish your turn, they make you sit at the edge of the pool, like, not looking towards the water. You're just sitting there, and you're just hearing all your fucking buddies back there just drowning, just yeah. screaming, dude. That's kind of scary. But that's where we lost a lot of people. So we did that. So I'm going to go ahead and just, like, make it shorter because I don't want, I know we're on time crunch. But after that whole thing, I think seven of us made it through at the very end. And um, even if you make it through, you're not guaranteed the spot. So it's like, so after the whole thing's done, you go up against the board, you know, with all your cadre and like the, the person in charge of the, the training there, the chief master sergeant, and basically the cadre vote, like, you know, yes, give him class eight, no, but the chief master sergeant, the one in charge, she has the final say. So you can get, a, you can get a majority of votes to get the class eight, but they'd be like, no, I don't want them. Mm. So that's kind of what happened to me. So I got a majority vote, but the chief master sergeant, they're like, he's like, no, I don't want to take them. So I ended up meeting, I ended up seeing one of the chief master sergeants at the airport on my way back. I had to ask him, I was like, hey, so what, what was I missing? Why could, why did you guys tell me no? He's like, well, so, you know, like I said, we keep track of everything. They keep so much data so they can predict who's going to be the most successful candidate in this retraining pipeline. And there's like this line, like this baseline. And with yours, like you kept going above it and then below it and above it and below it and above it. So like it wasn't super consistent mm-hmm. and we weren't willing to make the the risk mm. so sorry you'll never be a combat controller you can't come back and try again because usually you can just try again because like you you can't change personality like physically you're just fine like you killed it it was meant as a personality test is what's keeping you from doing this wow yeah wow. i suck you know i saw a lot of that too when when we came back a lot of guys were like oh, i'm just gonna go be a cop yeah but you know <laughs> we're guys like trained to kick down doors and shoot people and it's a little different. It's a very different <laughs> scenario. You're gonna have to learn the law inside yeah. out. You got to be able to make, you know, very quick decisions that you will have to live with the repercussions. Mm-hmm. Of, which isn't to say you don't in the military, mm-hmm. but you definitely get away with a lot more. It's way different. It's because war. your job is different. It's war. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah. literally in war. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of guys that came out, they were like, they took the the psychological eval and. Um, I don't want to say they failed it. That's not where it's not. Kind of not failed. Failed. It's more of a, this is not the kind of person yeah. that would make a good cop. Mm-hmm. You would make a good, so many other things, police officer. No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that can be, that can be a detriment. You know, it is. I, I think that, you know, you can, there's a, there's a lot of things that go into the psychological aspect of any position and you just, you, you never really know. And sometimes you just, it just may not be the right thing for you. Even if you think it is, it's, it's just not. I was supposed to go to to, to RIP, to the Ranger Indoctrination Program, mm. when I initially joined. I was supposed to go up there straight from Airborne School. And I got to the point, I was like, I don't want this anymore. Yeah. I don't want it. I declined it. I was like, I don't, I don't give a shit if I go to Ranger Battalion. You know, I've been to Airborne School, infantry. Um, and the truth is, I didn't know the difference between Ranger Battalion and going to Ranger School. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was a kid. A lot of people don't. Yeah. I didn't know shit. So I was like, I could still go to Ranger School if I yeah. wanted to, you know. So I was like, I'll just get, I just want to get to my unit. Yeah, yeah. By then, it was, it was like 20 weeks that I did in training. And I was mm-hmm. like, I'm fucking cooked. It wears on you, man. I just have anything left. So I was like, cool. I'm not fucking, I'm not cool for Ranger Battalion. Mine. You know, but um, yeah, it definitely, it definitely tests you. So that didn't work out. And I'm guessing probably at that point, you're like, it's time to go. So at that point, so when I got back from that training, I was back here in Utah, you know, I was depressed for like probably a good four or five, six months. Cause I was like, I was convinced this is what I was, this was my purpose in life. This is what I was going to do. So what the fuck do I do now? You know, so I was, I felt like I was just like a mindless soul wandering the earth. I was like, I have no clue what I want to do. No idea. Um, and then, so I was just kind of chugging along, you know, getting through day to day life, like just lost. And then one of my buddies, um, he ended up PC, well, he wasn't my buddy at the time, but he PCS here into my shop. You know, we got along, we became friends, and he was getting ready for his first bodybuilding show. He's like, Yeah, man, you should come check it out, come see what it's like. I was like, Yeah, cool, whatever. So I ended up, you know, I went to the show, I watched it, and I was like, All right, this looks pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I'll give it a shot, I'll give it a shot. You know, I've always loved working out. Like, it's not like a new thing to me. Like, I've always, I knew what bodybuilding was. I didn't competitive bodybuilding, but I knew everything about it. Cause like I said, my dad got into it for a little bit. Yeah. And he would leave, you know, you know, muscular development magazines, you know, he had magazines all around the house. So I know who Jay Cutler was and all that stuff for growing up. But yeah, after that, I was like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. So I was like, you know, I'm going to 
I want to try bodybuilding. I'm going to compete. Um, did my first show March 2017. March 2017 was my first show I did. Um, I ended up winning my class. Didn't win the whole show. Didn't win the overall. But after that, I was like, yeah, like, I'm hooked. That's it. I mean, I'm hooked because, you know, coming from what I was doing, you know, the whole training special operations, like my mentality, it transferred over into bodybuilding easily. Yeah. Like the discipline and the mentality you have to have, like it's almost, it's so similar. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I was such a smooth transition. I was like, I fucking love this. This is, this is something I love to do. And like being able to put now this into bodybuilding, you're just a smooth transition. It just fit. And I fucking loved it. And I fell in love with it. Cause you know, one thing I love about bodybuilding too, is like, it's an individual sport. Yeah. You're, yes. You're, yes. It's a team. Cause you have a coach, you know, you got your sports system, your friends or whatever, but like, it all comes down to you. Yeah. You know, like if you, if you go to that show and you win that day, you were the best person that day because of what you did yeah. during that whole prep. It all falls on you. You know, you can't, you can't blame nobody else. You can't blame this person. You can't blame your teammate because it's an individual sport. It's based off how hard you push yourself, how disciplined were you? Yeah. How much work did you put in? Yeah, it's not a it's not like a team sport. It's like, well, I, I, I passed, I did some good passes, you know, or I did an assist. I did my part. You know? Yeah, it's like so, and our whole team won, so yep. we're all winners. You know, it's like yeah, it is very much the biggest difference. And I know that's something with Dash too. Like he doesn't have any interest in team sports. Team sports, yeah. You know, and I, and I do think that that is a personality thing. Mm-hmm. You know, some people they just thrive better. They're able to focus more mm-hmm. when it is on themselves mm-hmm. rather than on the whole hundred percent you know? and totally agree. I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that at all. No. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, I think some people are built for team sports and that's, you know, like, well, I'm a great, I'm great in this position in this big sport. And mm-hmm. some people are like, well, I don't want to be great at one position. I just want to be great at whatever I'm focused on. Yeah. Whatever, all positions, be it bodybuilding, martial arts or something like that, where it is up to you. Absolutely. Like your skill set is, yeah. uh, makes a huge difference. Totally agree. I love it, man. Like, I, I love the pressure of it. I love having the pressure of just, it's all on me, not anybody else. Well, there's so much discipline. It. It's, I think the discipline aspect gets overlooked quite a bit. It's not just discipline when you're in the gym pushing weights. That's the easy it's, part, bro. That's yeah, the fun part. The discipline comes with the right amount of sleep, the mm-hmm. right foods, the right, you know, the, the right diet, having it dialed in. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, 100%. All of that. Um, and I don't think that people... Put enough stock in that. Like, oh, I'm gonna do. I just gotta get in the gym. I just gotta work out every day for three hours a day. It's like, no, <laughs> man. The working out is the easy part. Yeah. You know, it's like, what are you doing the, the other 24 hours of the day? You know what I mean? What are you doing after that for the rest of the day? Exactly. That's where it fucking matters. And it's your consistency and your routine and your schedule and how long can you keep that consistency up for? Yeah. People just get burnt great. out. Yeah. It's just you know, it's 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 Groundhog Day every single day. It's the same thing every single day. Yeah. You know, you miss out on a lot of fucking. Fun times, going out drinking, partying, or events, or this and that. You miss out on a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And if you're not willing to give that up and sacrifice that, you will not be a good bodybuilder. You know, people try to use this. People always use the word like, yeah, you got to find that balance. Like, man, balance is for fucking mediocre people. Yeah. Like, if you want to be balanced, you're never going to be great. You know, you can do, you can be okay. But if you want to be one of the best, like, you know, some people do, they have this burning desire to be the fucking best at what they do. They're obsessed. They're not balanced. There's no balance. Yeah. That, is, that doesn't exist for yeah. easy. Scales are tipped. Yeah, for elite champions, like success, successful people, like balance doesn't exist. Yeah. It's not true. So if you want that, by all means, like it, go do it. You know? yeah. No, there's no harm, no foul, but not everybody's going to do that because there's always going to be somebody else that wants it more than you and they're going to give more, they're going to sacrifice more and they're going to be more successful than you because they're willing to sacrifice more. Yeah. So you want your... You First show, or you have your first show in 2017, mm-hmm. uh, and you've continued your journey uh, into the sport. What led to you wanting to choose classic physique mm-hmm. as as your main focus? That is correct, right? Classic, yes. That's what your, your focus is. Um, what led to that and ultimately getting your IFBB card and now about to compete in Olympia? How? Just tell me a little bit about that journey going from once you're in and then getting that IFBB and now going there. Yeah. Excuse me. So I chose class. So the classic came around. Classic's still relatively new in the IFBB. I think it came around like 2016, mm. 2017. Was it really that new? So yeah, it only been out oh, for like shit. a year when I first decided to, you know. I thought that shit's been around since like the Arnold days. No, know? men's physique's been around longer than classic physique. Oh, shit. 
So, but Absolutely. around the time that I got into it, into bodybuilding competing is when, you know, classic just kind of came around and my buddy competed in it. And I was like, you know, I think I'd like that better because I had some okay legs. I didn't have chicken legs. So I was like, <laughs> and I just, I like the beauty of it, you know, the classic of the, the, yeah. just the aesthetics of it and like the posing, all that stuff. It just all resonated and fit with me and I fit into the category perfectly. Yeah. So, you know, I did my first show in 2017, won my class, 2018, did my other show, my next show. Won the overall in that. 2019, won another overall. And then 2019 was also my first national show I did. So the way it goes is regional, national, which is a pro qualifier. So you have to win, qualify at a regional show to go to a national show and compete for your pro card. Mm -hmm. So you have to win your class at a um, class or an overall at a regional show so you can go to nationals. So 2019, I decided to do my first national show um, in December or November, I think it was. It's called The Nationals. It was in Miami. And that was my first national show. I took, I think, like 13th or 12th, okay. second call-outs. Um, I was like, all right, you know, I need to... I, I, I see... So that was that was very humbling as well, too. Like, you know, sure. obviously, like, you know, I had some confidence because I won, like, three shows, won two overalls. But then when you go to a national level, it's a whole new it's a whole new ball game, you know? Yeah. These are, like, some of the best amateurs in the world coming from the pro card. So when I was back there backstage, I was like, how the fuck are these guys not pros? These guys all look amazing. Like completely different caliber <laughs> yeah. from a regional to a national. So, I mean, I, I was real with myself. I was like, yeah, I'm obviously not going to win. But, you know, if I can get second call outs or somewhere in the first call outs, I'll be happy with that. Got second call outs. And I was like, hey, back to the drawing board. I obviously need more size. I need to take some time off. Had an off season. Um, wasn't the longest one. I probably should have been longer. But I was still qualified for another national show. So I did another national show in 2020. Right when COVID hit, so like they were canceling so many shows in 2020, oh, yeah, sure. but they were still able to move venues around to different states that were a lot more lax on the COVID. Did you just like wear masks on stage and stuff. No, we didn't have to do that. We had there, so <laughs> there, so this so USA is usually in Vegas, but during COVID they moved it to Arizona because mm. they had more lax the COVID rules. Yeah. So that was my second national show. I think I took seventh or eighth at that one. So I improved, you know, improved from the last national show I did. Then after that, I was like, all right, I'm taking a year off, year and a half, taking a lot of time off to put on some size. So next time I go, I could be competitive. Like, I, I don't want to lose anymore. Gotcha. You know, like, I love winning, but losing sucks. I hate losing more. Yeah. Like, losing sucks. Then, I mean, if you like losing, you'll just probably just keep doing it. Just be a loser. Don't like yeah. losing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Losing fucks. Don't sucks. ever fall in love with losing. Losing it's sucks, but it's also important to know how to be a loser as well. Like you have to know how to take oh, a yeah. loss. Know how to take a loss. Don't be a poor sport. You no, know, don't blame anybody else for your loss. Like you weren't that good that day. Yeah. This, these people were better than you. So what are you going to do? Are you going to fucking cry about it? Or yeah. are you going to go back to the drawing board and do what you got to do to be better? I always say, and I, and I hammer this into Dash's head all the time. I was like. You're going to learn more from your losses than you ever will from your wins. 100%, man. Like those, the, the times when you lose, those are the times when you're like, you have to stop. Like, what what did I do wrong? Yes. What Be self-aware. Like, like instead of wallowing in like, shit, I lost. Like, I wasn't good enough. It's like, Dude, so well, why weren't you? Yeah. Like, what, what was it that held you back? That's where you really, because that's what's going to help you win. Yes. You know? And then, and when you win, it's like, hey, you did it. Here's your trophy. Great job. And you're like, okay. What did I learn from this? What did I do yeah. right? Yeah. You know what, what? What? What got me there? But the truth is, you already learned all those lessons to get to that. Point, yeah. You know, and it's like, okay, so this is how you succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I do that again? Yes. You know, but like getting there is a whole other ball game. That's why I tell Dash, I'm like, man, you know, don't ever think that like if you get into competing, that like you have to win every single time right mm -hmm. off the bat because losing is going to teach you how to win. You're learning so much more from losing. And, and then it's going to make that victory so much better. Exactly. And so if you lose, better. and then you're just like, well, fuck this. It's like, yeah. well, it was never meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. It wasn't meant for you then. If you can't handle losing, because you're going to lose more than you win in bodybuilding. Yeah. Like, it's just inevitable. It's just the way it is, you know? Well, I mean, even in Arnold, you know, like, the dude showed up, you know, he showed up in, in the U.S. and, and started competing. They were like, oh, like, look at this guy. Yeah. You know, he's like, you know, he, they like say, oh, he's like, he's like fat. He's like plunk. He was like, what the shit? The like, guy was like the champion, you know, in Europe and now I'm here. And it's like, you know, everybody has faced humility. Everybody yeah. has faced those moments where they're like, shit, and, and am I just not good enough? And yeah. It's like, you could, you could ask those questions, but then you need to start asking the right questions. Like, well, how do I overcome that? Yeah. Like, get to that next level. 100%. And not everybody can, you know. Some that, people are just like, oh, I'm good. I'm just going to try this other thing. It's like, yeah. well, you keep trying new things. That's fine. But sometimes you do need to, but it's like, 
if you have a dream, you have a goal, you have an ambition, you got to stay locked in, you know, do failure. You're all of it. hundred percent, man. Like it's, it's a long fucking journey and people say all the time, like you have to love the journey and the process of it. And I didn't know what that meant until probably like when I finally got my pro card, like that year when I was prepping, I was like, I think I really know what that means now. It's like, you have to truly enjoy it. Cause like getting a pro card, nothing happens when you finally win the pro card. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like enjoying that process and the journey and seeing yourself push through, you know, cause everybody has shit happen in life. Like you're going to go through preps. It's like, Oh, this happened or this happened. It wasn't a smooth prep. Like big deal, dude. People complain about this shit all the time. Like everybody deals with stuff during prep. Sure. sure. Everybody, everybody has problems in life. Nothing's, nobody's life is perfect. Yeah. You don't get to pause everything just because oh, you're training exactly. for something that you want to do. It's like, 100%. You still got to deal with everything else. Man. Exactly. So it's <laughs> like when you, when you enjoy that journey that you're taking to get that pro card, like really are in the moment and present of it and seeing your progression and like how you're progressing, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, all of that, that makes it so much better. Cause I, I've said it before, like you're a pro before you get your pro card. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. A pro card doesn't mean shit. Worry about, worry about building a pro level physique. Act like a pro. Act like a champion. You know, like look at your favorite pro and try to mimic what they do. You know, it's how you live your every every single day life. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to go get my pro card. The pro card doesn't mean shit. Act like a pro and your, your chances of becoming a pro are going to be 10 times better. Yeah. So you get your, you got your card at, was it Hurricane? No, I got my card. So after, so after USA, I took time off. Uh, competed again in 2022, 2022, um, that's when I was, it's like a two year off season, 2022, I had to qualify again for a national show, so I did a show in June of 2022, won the overall there, and then I did the NPC Universe, which is a pro qualifier, it's a national show, and it was like two weeks after, I think, two or three weeks after, went to that, um, I ended up getting fourth at that show, so mm-hmm. I was close, I was like, fuck, dude, that was super close. And I was, dude, I was I'm not going to lie. I was pretty upset after that one because sure. at prejudging, they had me in second place. And at most national shows nowadays, first and second place get a pro card. So at prejudging, they had me in second place. You know, we ended the prejudging. I was second place. Came back for finals and they ended up rejudging the whole thing. And I ended up, I got pushed down to fourth. Yeah. So I was like, oh, excuse me. So fuck, man. Like I was really upset about it. But ended up being one of the best things to happen to me because after that, I was like, I don't know. I was talking to my coach. I was like, dude, I really don't want to do USA's. USA's was four weeks after Universe. I was like, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm fucking tired. You know, this prep kicked my ass. Like, I don't know if I can do four more weeks. He's like, no, you should 100% absolutely do USA's. You just took fourth at Universe. Like, you're obviously good. You can do this. You're you're right there. Four more weeks. You're going to get better because you have four more weeks to get tighter, harder, leaner, whatever it is. Do USA's. So I was like, fuck, man. <laughs> I was like, all right. I was like, all right, let's do it. So two weeks go by, I'm still prepping, and I went out to Vegas two weeks early with my buddy Brock, um, who was also going to compete at USA. So we went out two weeks early to stay at our buddy's house, almost like a training camp type thing. Sure, yeah. So yeah, there was just no distractions. It was just straight bodybuilding, man. It was literally ground all day right there. It was wake up, cardio, eat, train, sleep, eat, all that shit. Yeah. So no distractions. It was fucking awesome. I mean, it sucked being away from my wife, but you know, it really, I think it really made a big difference in how my prep went because there's no distractions, way less stress. Yeah. Um, so get to USA's, do USA's, end up winning the whole show. I won the wow. the overall. So I was Mr. USA for Classic Physique in 2022. You know, and had I won my pro card at Universe, second place pro card, or, you know, the overall at USA's, which is a more prestigious show, and now I have the, the title of Mr. USA. So it's like taking fourth place at Universe was meant to happen like you know everything happens yeah. for a reason so i'm glad yeah, that yeah, happened yeah, like, yeah so i'm glad that it. happened because i got to go to usa's and win the overall which is something i've always wanted you know that was a goal of mine back in 2020 when i first did it i was like i want to come back here win the overall and win my pro card at usa's because usa is like i said it's probably one of the more the first or second most prestigious national show in the npc yeah so everything happens for a reason you know won my pro card there and that was fucking insane man that was so that was crazy, man. I was, I couldn't believe it. You know, something I wanted so bad. So like when I finally got it, you know, it was just like a dream come true. So, so when you get your card, what does that entail? Like, how does that work? Pro card? Like, yeah. Yeah. How, like, like, what are they, what does that mean? Like, does somebody like, is there an official thing where they're like, Hey, congratulations. You have it. Like, here's a, a card. Or, does that give you anything that like says like, like it makes it official? How does that work? Yeah. So now, so when, if you win a pro qualifier, you turn, you get your pro card. 
you now have professional status. So now you can compete. So the is the IFBB and NPC. NPC is the amateurs. Right. IFBB is the professionals. So in order to compete in IFBB, you know, and you know, win prize money and go to the Olympia, other other things like that, you have to have your IFBB pro card, which is won by winning a national show. So now that I have my pro card that I want from from the from the USA's, I now have professional status and I can go compete at an IFBB pro show. And when you do that, all you got to do is just, you know, it's like when NPC, you have to get your NPC card, you have to pay um, to, to get your NPC card to compete at an amateur show. Same thing with the IFPB pros. You have to basically just go on the one website, pay for your active status. So you have to be active, pay for your status for that year, and you can compete as many shows as you want. So it's like a yearly renewal thing. Like you, But if you're not competing in a year or two, you don't have to renew your pro card because you're not competing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Would you be go back and like re-sign for it? Or yeah. After so it, once you're in, you're in. Yeah, once you're in, you're in. Okay. Yeah. So like, but if you don't want to compete for two years, you don't have to renew the pro card until you're about to compete. Okay. Yeah. So for you, you're now gearing up for Olympia, which yes. is, I, I mean, I worry that's the big show, right? That's, that's the Super Bowl of bodybuilding. Yeah. So like, that's the big. I mean, so you're essentially going to, you know, the Super Bowl of your yes. career. Yep. Um. And I know you're you're training. You're getting ready to start like prep in May, right? Next month. Yeah, next month, pretty soon. So, just tell me a little bit about what that means to you. Like, I mean, you're going to. Like, this is a big deal. I don't this, think there's. Yeah. I think a lot of like you know, to people laymen that don't really know about bodybuilding and in this kind of field. And I, the truth is, I didn't really know that much about it until Dash started getting really interested in it. Yeah. Um, but tell me a little bit about just like what that's like for you getting ready to go and compete at Olympia. Like, it's just a huge thing. Yeah, it's fucking insane. It's unreal because, you know, obviously when everybody starts bodybuilding, they're like, all right, yeah, I want to, you know, eventually get my pro card and go compete at the Olympia. That's always and the goal. It's it's like when, you know, kids would grow up, they're like, I want to be a professional football player. Yeah, I want to go to the Super Bowl. Bowl. Like, yeah. But you, you are going. Yeah. Like, so that's, that's, it's, a, it's, that's a huge it's, thing. It's still so hard to comprehend because I've never, I always knew it was going to happen eventually because I know I can stick things out, and I'm very consistent. But see, that's a mindset thing right there. Mm-hmm. Like you just said, I always knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen eventually. But see, that's the thing. Like, a lot of people don't really think that. They you don't. Know? They don't think that way. And I think that's an important... Uh, that's a very important thing about somebody that's trying... To, anything in life. Anything. anything. It's not just bodybuilding. It's just, it's, you got to have that mindset. I know it's going to happen. Yeah. You know? Because if you don't think that way, how... What, you, you, you're waiting for luck? Yeah, exactly. You, know, you wait for lightning to strike. Hundred percent. It's not. It's, it doesn't work like that. You have to like. I. I tell everybody like visualize what you want, man. Like, yeah. It. I. Hundred percent believe it makes a difference. Like your mind will start to believe it. Like I visualized me winning my pro card thousands of times before I actually won it. The whole thing, like the stage, you know how it happened, how I yeah, got yeah. it, yeah, all that shit. Yeah, so we like talked about that before. Like visualizing yourself literally on stage with the light. Yes, everything. I close my eyes. Your I routine. See it. You gotta yes. see it happening. Yes. And there, there's such a, a deep connection between your subconscious mind, mm-hmm. your and, and even I mean I would argue your soul. Like it gets embedded 100%. within you, where you're like, the, what I'm seeing is who I am. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I totally agree. It's just a, so essential. It's a very underrated thing. People just don't think it makes a difference, but it does. Like I will stand, I will die on that hill, saying like you know your mind is so fucking powerful, yeah, and it's capable of so many things. Like don't underestimate it, man. Use it. Stop having that loser mentality, you know? Yeah. Stop yeah. doubting yourself. Stop calling yourself, oh, I'm just, I just suck. I'm fat. I'm a loser. I'm not going to do this. I can't do that. Stop telling yourself that. You start to believe it. Speak positive things to yourself. Tell yourself confident things. And like I said, I knew eventually I was going to get there. I didn't think it was going to happen this fast. Yeah. You know, I did my, I turned pro in 2022, did my first pro show in 2023 and won my first pro show. I'm going to the Olympia after my first pro show. I didn't think it was going to happen that fast, but it did. Like I said, but I knew I was going to go eventually because I will fucking, I'm, I'm consistent, man. Like I, if I, if I put my mind to something, I'm going to finish it up and I'm very passionate about body work. So it's like, I knew I was going to get there eventually just went. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to happen this fast, which is so mind blowing to me. Even when I won the show, you know, the lady was like, she's like, Hey, come say a few words. And I was talking and she was like, you know what else happened though? I was like, what? She's like, you're going to the Olympia. I was like, holy fuck. I didn't. Even, they just crossed. They just, I was so like I was on cloud nine. Like it didn't even cross my mind. Like, it was cloud ten. Yeah, I almost forgot. I was like, I can't go to the Olympia. So it's just it's crazy to think that you know my second professional bodybuilding show I'm ever going to do is going to be the Olympia. 
So it's just, it's wild. It's crazy, man. Like, and then it didn't sink in for a long time, but now that I'm getting closer and closer and closer and they're releasing like the qualified athletes for the Olympia and they see my name on there, you know, with some of these greats that I've been, you know, following, looking up to since I started bodybuilding. Yeah. It's just fucking, it's, it's a dream come true to see my name on that list. Yeah. So, I mean, Dash and I were looking at it. That's crazy. Look at that. And you'll just, yeah, it's insane, man. Like it's, that's so fucking crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, that's your trainer, dude. You're just going to Olympia. <laughs> Like, that's some fucking serious bragging shit right there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, I, I want to take a step back okay. from that a little bit and talk about kind of your day-to-day and how you make a living. Because as a bodybuilder, you know, you, you make money on stage if you know if you win. You know, sometimes if you win, just like in different echelons. But you do training, personal training. You yeah. train my son, Dash, and you train a lot of other people. How does, what is the day to day? How does that, what is that like for you in terms of like how you conduct yourself in terms of making a living? What is that like? Like, what is, what is your, um, what is your focus on that? How to make a living bodybuilding? Yeah. So I want to go ahead and just preface with this you know, people that get into bodybuilding thinking they're going to make a lot of money, really rethink that, you know, because you're not going to make a shit ton of money in bodybuilding unless you're like, so the elites, yep. you know, you're not going to make a living off of it unless you're one of the elites. Um, if you don't truly have a passion for this, you're not going to last. If you're doing this for the money, you're not going to last. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. Because I feel like a lot of people think when you get your pro card, it's your pro. Like, oh, do you want to get a pro? What's your, I was thinking my pro card, like, doors are going to open up. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Nothing happens, dude. Yeah. Nothing. So It's, it's like, going to be like Happy Gilmore where he's just like. Yeah. Getting fifth place and getting a giant check yeah. every time he goes somewhere. That's just not the way it not is. Good, it's not gonna and it's not enough to pay the bills. No, even when you win a show, I want $2,000 for my pro show. That doesn't Which is like covers hotel, travel. That's what I'm saying. That didn't cover shit. It didn't cover <laughs> anything. So it's like you're not going to win money. You're not going to win enough money, especially in classic physique, um, to make a living. Yeah. So if you want to make money in bodybuilding, you have to build a brand for yourself. You know, Build the following. Build the social media. You know... Build this like character, not character, but like put yourself out there and just be yourself for one. Don't be one person in real life and then some fucking mega made up character on Instagram yeah. that just makes you look stupid and like show. Well, I mean, who wants, you know, and, and that's something I was going to get into too is the social media and the, the branding. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess we could tie all that together because it does go hand in hand. With making you know? money for bodybuilding. There's so many, yeah, I mean, like. Every bodybuilder, like all the, even the bigger names like uh, the Seabum and everybody, they got it. They have brands. They, have they, brands. Have, they partner with brands. You're partnered with Nutrex, right? Yes. Like everybody partners with a brand mm-hmm. um, and that kind of becomes where the money comes. You know, that's, that's where they start to make, you know, some money. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's not like if you're not competing, say that year, because see Seabum isn't competing from whatever, you know, if he you, if you wasn't competing at Olympia, you know, he's not going to get a check. No big check that's going to come, you know. Well, the thing with Seabum, though, he's the exception because well, he's just because now he's he's, he's part C-Bum. owner. He's part <laughs> owner of the raw nutrition brand, so like exactly yeah, those yeah. fifty thousand dollars checks he gets from the Olympia for winning is like chump change. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't well, that's what I'm getting yeah. at. It's like the money to be made. Mm-hmm. There's money to be made outside of the stage, yes. off the stage, on the stage. It's it's yeah, getting it's, better though. So like recently, up like this up like this past year. Um, they're getting more corporate sponsors, so which yeah. is when you get more corporate sponsors, there's more prize money to be given at these shows. So now I think uh, it happened for wellness, classic, and open bodybuilders. So open bodybuilding they're going from like ten thousand dollar checks to like twenty thousand dollar checks yeah. now. Well, the Arnold Classic is going up too. Arnold yeah, they went up like hundred thousand. Yeah, he was like, he's like Olympia's going up. I'm going up yeah. too. So I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. And then you know, classic is going up from like two grand, hopefully to ten grand, but. If you want to make money in bodybuilding, like you said, partner up with companies, you know, but the only way companies want you is if you have a following, you know, what kind of person are you? Like, how's your character? You know, do people relate to you? Do people actually like you? Like, yeah. and then it just depends on how, how much of a following you have is how big your contract's going to be. You know, you can sign with a company and be like, this person's going to get $5,000 a month because of their, their, their reach and their following. You don't have as much, so we're going to give you a $1,000. Sure. So it's like you have to build a brand, build a following, um, to to get that money. So there's money out there to be made. It's just you have to you have to make it happen. Yeah. And then obviously the better you are at competing, the more shows you win. The better bodybuilder you are 
that's also going to play a part in you know what companies want to work with you. Sure, yeah, because the name itself, the name, yeah. There's yeah. different brands out there that are more influencer based, and there's brands out there that are more bodybuilder based. Like it's just you got to find your niche and like, and also if you're going to sign with a company, like I highly suggest, and I think you should always sign with a company that you actually align the same values with. Yeah. Don't just sell yourself out and be like, oh, they're going to pay me the most money, but I don't like the products. I don't like what they stand for. I don't like their culture but they're going to pay me the most money. Yeah. That's how you lose people, I feel like. I feel that's how you lose respect. Well, yeah, I mean, eventually, you know, those the, people see through that, right? Yeah. Like, let's say you move on to a new brand. Like, you're, say, New Tricks now, say, then you go on, just for example, you go to Raw. And then, it's like, you know, the people that were buying New Tricks because you were using it, to like, well, is New Tricks bad now? Mm -hmm. You know, or is Raw better? It's like, but I think that you say, hey, no, this is a brand that I use, I like. Uh, I support it and then I partner with it. I feel like that makes a big difference. Hundred percent for people because transparency. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that one of the things that I've struggled with too, as somebody that you know uses different products, you know, is just kind of like finding out what the fuck actually works. You know, that's gonna that, that has the best benefit because yeah. if you type in, and I'm sure if you've done this, like you go to Google, and you type in, okay, this this certain supplement I'm here about that I'd like to try, you get like literally like. 50 sponsor posts before you can get to anything that's, yeah. that might not be biased. Yeah. You know, it's hard to find um, exact uh, reviews and, and real science behind that stuff and to be like, okay, this seems legit. You know, a lot of times for me now, I just look for bad reviews yeah. to see what the negative stuff is. Like, I want to hear what people are, or there's already a thousand things saying, hey, use this. I want to hear what people say, don't use it. Yeah. And why? Yeah. You know? Like, 100%. That makes a bigger difference to me. And yeah. then, you know, but yeah, people put their faith and trust in you. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately becomes putting into the brand as well. Yeah. So, but yeah. Um, let's kind of go off on a tangent. But yeah, that's a, obviously a good way to make money, but also personal training. So how do you determine training wise? Like, are you, when you take clients on, is it something where you're like, I need the money for this guy. I need the money. So I'm going to take this guy. Or is it something where you're like, you know, I'm not a I'm not a trainer. I do that a hundred percent do that. You know, at first when you start, I feel like we're trying to build your clientele. You're trying to get coaching out there. Yeah, you can you take, you take anybody. Yeah, yeah. But you know, as time goes on, you start to realize like, you know, that 200, 300 bucks a month is not worth know what they're giving me in return sure you no know, because you know you got some shitty clients out there man like really unrealistic people that don't want it as bad as they say they do they be like yeah you know you know i've i've been kind of letting myself go for the past five years and you know and i see this and i want to get into shape they don't see results in like two or three months they're like yeah i just don't think it's working like people don't understand like if it takes you five years to walk in the forest it's gonna take you five years or maybe longer to walk back out yeah you know like you can't you can't like eat like shit and neglect your health for five years and expect to be ripped with a six pack in <laughs> three four five six months and it's work see, that's what i always say. I say it took time to put it on is it take time to it's take it take off? even longer to, to yeah. put it off man like it's so easy to put it on but it's harder to take it off because yeah. you know like we went back like it's the consistency and like discipline a lot of people just do not, they're not capable of that. Well, and I found that too. I mean, I've had, I've had multiple trainers throughout the years. I've had some really great trainers. I've worked with some really nice people. I worked with uh, Rob Sulivar um, for a good while. And I thought his training was really good. Um, and a lot of times for me, a lot of times I, I felt like I got to a point where it's like a plateau. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, well, we're not really changing anything or doing anything. So, yeah, I'm just going to move on. But um, I, I knew anytime when I was training with somebody, I was doing my check-ins or whatever, and I was like, I know it's going to be a shitty week. Mm -hmm. But you know why? I didn't rest enough. Uh -huh. I ate like shit. Mm -hmm. I didn't follow the plan. And I feel like a lot of people do that, and then they just make excuses. Excuses, like no accountability, or they lie about it. Lies. It's totally like, lies. It's like, it's like yeah, uh, you're up five pounds this week, but you said you were 100% on everything. It's like, yeah, I don't know what happened. Like, don't fucking lie. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. Like, yeah. there's a physic there's literally no possible way for you to be up five or six pounds in a week and you followed everything 100%. Well, and that's the, you know, the, these these days people like don't want to listen to even regular science, basic no. science. And it's like, dude, like, if you're eating in a deficit and you're working out, you're going to lose. You're going to lose weight. It's you're not going to put on five pounds overnight. If you're doing that, like it's just not gonna happen. No, you know, and I would know. It's like I'm like, yeah, well, I fucking, I, 
A drink on Friday night. You kill. You can kill it all in one night too. Yeah. I think that's what these people don't Weekends, realize. Yeah. Like how one day of eating like complete garbage could fuck all the workouts you did that week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just take the gains. Yes. That's the one of these people that just take the gains. You can. You can have a great week of working out. You can do all kinds of, you know, do your cardio, your lifting, everything. You eat it on point. And then that Saturday rolls around and you're just like. You can throw it all away. I'm just going to fuck it. I'm going to have fucking donuts for breakfast. I'm going to have fucking pizza for lunch. I'm going to sit around and do nothing. And it's like, and then I'm going to drink, go drink it all night. It's like, bro, you why just am I up, did everything. Why am I up five pounds? Well, people, I think a lot of it too is people just don't really understand it. Or like, it's just like the ignorance of it. It's like. Yeah. Look, man, the whole point is you want to be a deficit. Not too big of a deficit. You know, a very manageable. Yeah, you don't want to be like passing out. You know, so say like you're, say you're in a caloric deficit of like three, 400 calories every single day for the week. Monday through Friday. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're in that deficit. Come Saturday, you decide to say, you know what? Fuck it, dude. I want to go have some pizza, a drink, whatever. And you overeat by like 2,000 calories. That's it. That's you just, your you week. Just, you, just, you just negated everything you did that week <laughs> and added more. Like, it's just, you have to look at it like that. Like, that's why I try to teach my clients. I might just get to say, do this, do this, do this, do this. I want them to learn, like, how to sustain this for a long time and, like, understand, like, how it works. Yeah. So, it's like, if you, if, if, if you can take that away when you work with me, whenever we stop working together, that's all I want. Yeah. You know? Like, I want you to learn how to do this for a long time. Yeah. Can't just, like, hey, I want to lose 30 pounds. Okay, what happens if you lose 30 pounds? Now what? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Probably, you're going to probably put it back on. But just learn how to be healthy and have that sustainable lifestyle for the rest of your life. That's what I want from my clients. And I think that's one of the biggest things. It's something that I told Dash too. And that's, I used to drag Dash kicking and screaming to the kid. <laughs> At 10 years old, you know, I was like, you know, I could see he was like starting to fall into like the video game trap. And, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of like not really doing anything. And, you know, uh, you know for my own personal history, when I, was, I was like a fat kid in high school and... Mm -hmm. I was like, the truth is I really, it wasn't, I wasn't motivated so much by looking good. I was more motivated, like, I'd like to have sexual relations with a girl. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I want some chicks. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, when I was 18, I lost, like, 60 pounds my yeah. senior year of high school. I was unrecognizable. Too. Yeah. They, I mean, grew my hair out. People, they just didn't recognize me. But it was amazing, you know? And, it was, and the truth is, like, I did a thousand calorie a day diet, which is not very healthy. But that's what I did. It, it works. I mean, um, and I ran thirty minutes every day. I did push ups, sit ups. I didn't even go to gym. I didn't lift weights at all. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was all cardio stuff. But I was just like, you know, I was like, I'm just gonna follow the science of this. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a calorie deficit, I'm just gonna eat a thousand calories a day. I'm gonna lose weight. You're gonna lose weight. And if I lost weight, I lost sixty pounds. You know, yeah. I, I kept that off for a very long time. And you know, then I joined the military. I started. Then I started lifting. I didn't lift throughout the military either. I really didn't start getting into lifting till. After I got out. Yeah. You know, that's really when I started to like focus on pushing weights. Um, and I did half marathons and shit for a while too, but that just destroyed my knees. And yeah, that was, you know, that, that's one of those things too, where I'd go run 14 miles, come home. And then you think, man, you're going to get shredded. It's like, yeah, but now I'm so fucking hungry and mm -hmm. starving. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and my body's like, please reply. You're just like freaking bitch. And that's what happens. You know, you're just like, you, and you don't even really think about it. You know, it comes down to it. You're like, man. You see that a lot. With, you'll see that a lot with runners too. You'll see a runner. You're like, how are you running? Mm -hmm. You don't look like you don't look like a runner. Yeah, because yeah. like, yeah, they're running and then they're going over. They're just like replenishing all those calories, just destroying food. That's crazy. Uh, so another going off of like clientele. So like, if somebody like like Dash who wants to be a competitor, how do you determine you know clients when they come to you? They're like, yeah, I want to be a competitor. How do you determine if they're even able to do it? You know, and is that something that you consider? With taking on clients, is it like is there a point you're like, yeah, I just, something's gonna happen for you? Or so I like to ask them, like, you know, what 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 is like, what is your say, someone comes to me and they want to compete. Okay, so you want to compete. What is like your overall goal with this? Do you want to just do it for funsies, just try it, or do you want to be good at it and do you want to pursue this? Is this something you truly like? You know, if I get the answer of like, oh, I just want to try it, just want to, give, just want to do it for fun. Okay, whatever, that's fine, no big deal. We'll put you on, you know, put you in the prep, try to get you on stage. But don't expect to, you know, to be the best. If yeah, you yeah. try it. Like, you just try to have fun. And then if you got the ones that are like, yeah, I think I love, I think I love this. You know, I'm just getting into bodybuilding. I just started working out a year ago and I, I, I follow it and like, I really like it. It's okay. Well, you got to prove that to me first. It's fair, lady, because you don't really know what it's like, you know. You know I've, been, I've been doing this for seven years and it's not super, super fun motivating. 
majority of the time anymore. And I, mean, I do this now because I'm disciplined and I, still, I truly love it. But is it fun, the day-to-day basis shit? No, not really. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You know, it's just I have this goal in mind. This is what I love to do. And, you know, it's the delayed gratification. So they're like, yeah, you know, I've been working out for a year. I want to try it. Okay, well, show me that you can act like a bodybuilder. Um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Um. So, you know, have them eat like a bodybuilder, you know, train like a body. Show me the consistency. Show me the discipline. Show me, show me you want to do it. Don't just tell me. Show me. You know, and then if they can show me that, you know, then I'll, I'll put more effort into that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to push them more towards that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But if, like, they're just fucking off and they're like, yeah, um, you know, I was 80% this week because of this. or was 90% this week because of that. I'm like, I'm like, look, man, when they first come on with me, I give them a little bit of leeway. You know, the first two or three weeks of the adjustment period, I'm like, hey, you know, I don't expect perfect. I don't expect to be perfect right now. Yeah. But if it's a consistent thing. Where it's just like you have an excuse as to like, oh yeah, I was like 90% this week or 95%. Like, what's stopping you from doing that 10%? The 10% is not that much. Like, what's so fucking hard about that? Just do it. Show it to me. Do it. Yeah. And it'll do it. Like, oh, actually, you know, 100% this week and it wasn't that much harder. It wasn't that much more effort. Like, I know that. It's like, so <laughs> stop making excuses as to why you can't be 100%. So like, if, they, if they're just showing me that they're not really about it, then I'm like, look, man, I'll, I'm... I'm very honest with my clients or people. Like I'm not gonna just blow smoke up your ass because I'm not gonna just. I could be one of those coaches out there who just tells you like, yeah, yeah, you, you, you look the best. You're gonna win, da, 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 just to you know take their money. Like I don't care. I don't do this for the money, man. You know the money's nice, but like I'm gonna tell you sh- what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Yeah. You know, and I'm very, I'm very honest about that. Well, I feel like most people. I don't know if it's most, but I mean, you're not just paying to be trained. You're also kind of you paid the truth. Truth in many ways. And knowledge. You know, like, you know, I say that to Dash too. I'm like, bro, like you need to like, like you should never hesitate to ask Nate anything. Under so you have questions, you have doubts, you have concerns. You should never hesitate. Never. Ask him. I tell, my, I tell all, all my clients know, that. You know, and, you know, listen. You know, when that stuff comes to you. And you know, I will say, you know, I see, I, I, I know Dash had some ups and downs. But truthfully, like when he had his girlfriend... That kind of took him down. Did it? It, it, it? it dragged him a bit because, and, and she was kind of, you know, had a had a, uh, a personality that kind of did that to him. And, you know, I, I, see, you know, I see him surge with that stuff um, mm. when, when they ultimately, when they broke up and things got a little better. But, you know, it's like, I, he also has like this great benefit that I always tell him too. And I think this is true for a lot of young kids. They're still at home, still with their parents is that, you know, parents will help. You yes. support parents. Dude, I'm making fucking breakfast for this kid. I made it this morning. You know, his yeah. like his turkey bacon and, and, and toast and cheese sandwiches. I make that shit every morning. When he goes to his mom's, she makes that shit for him every morning. Like I've always got rice cooking. Mm-hmm. I've always got we're always cooking up like slabs of fucking beef. And you know, like we went to the the Spunko show at the mall and Dash is like, Well, I gotta bring my food. And so, you know, we're walking around easy. It's rice and beef. <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's what it's about. That's, that's, like, that's bodybuilder. Yeah, I mean, and that's what I look at. And I'm like, I don't ever get annoyed with it. Because yeah. I'm like, I get it. Like, I'm and I'm paying for him, mm-hmm. you know, to, to pursue his dreams. So I want him to, to stay on track. I think that's another thing for for younger kids for, that are starting to get into this. And I feel like bodybuilding at this point is... It's at its its peak. I can't think of a time it's, where it's getting really big. Where so many really people are now, yeah, like like people are just kind of like gravitating mm-hmm. to it. You get like the broccoli head gym pros yeah, yeah. and all that other shit, you know. And you're seeing that more and more. Hundred percent. And when I was when I was Dash's age, when I was fourteen, I don't even I can't even think of a gym. I mean, we didn't have a gym that yeah. I knew of. You know, if, it, if there was, maybe there was, but it wasn't like these kind of like Mick gyms, you yeah. know, like you know, Vasas or whatever that are all over the place, which you can, you can get your workout done. You can. Like I, I, I turned pro working out at US. That's, that was my gym. Yes, that was my gym up until I, you know, turned pro and then moved over to the refinery gym. Yeah. And like, so, and I think, you know, going to somewhere like the refinery too, I think that is a big step for, for people that want to like take it seriously. Yes. Um, the culture and the, the environment matters. It's so different. It's so different that like Vasa feels like on one hand, it's like a meat market. I feel like people are there to like show off and maybe meet people. Like hundred percent. It's like social hour for them. Yeah. And then, you know, then you just have people that are like, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. No. You know? yeah, like they're just like take out machines. And I'm just like, bro. But like what I like about a place like the refinery, which is, you know, kind of a, 
I want to say small gym, but it's only getting bigger. It's getting big. But it's like, you know, it's a place where people go that really do our work out. Yes. They really are there to better themselves. And there's people of all different sizes, mm-hmm. but, you know, there's definitely not like amateur people that are just fucking off. No. There are people sitting on equipment, fucking around, like... People are there to work. Yeah, and we're, we're, we've done a good job. John and Jess have done a really good job about keeping the right people at that gym. You know, like they're very protective of that space. As they should be. Honestly. And the culture they're trying to create there. And, you know, they've done a very good job at it. You know, there's yeah. no there's no bad apples there. There's no you know, shitheads there. Like, and if people do show up like that, like, John gets rid of them immediately. He's like, I'm not going to have you here. We will be at. Yeah, it really is. Like, and I think finding for anybody out there that's, you know, that you're, you're looking for a gym. Where you're looking for somewhere that to truly better yourself, I think looking outside of those, you know, twenty dollar a month, you know, big gyms. Yeah. I think global gyms, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Like you got to find a gyms. place where you know the culture is nurturing in that way. I think I wanted to circle back real quick to what you're saying um, about Dash. Now, when he broke up with his girlfriends, we just started to really like thrive. Yeah. So that's one thing people don't take into account is like who you surround yourself with. And a lot of times, like, say a husband is trying to get in shape and the wife isn't on board with it. Yeah. It's going to make it, like, almost impossible because if people around you, your loved ones, or, like, your friends or whatever, don't support what you're doing. You know, like, say you go out to eat and, like, oh, why, why, why can't you just get a burger? It's like, no, I can't. You know, I have this diet I'm following. Like, I, I'm good. Yeah. No, thank you. Come on. It's just, what, what, what's one burger going to do? Or, like, what's one drink? What's one, like, people that just don't respect your boundaries of like what you're trying to do, yeah. it's gonna make it almost impossible for you, man. It's gonna be like it's just gonna be this like slow drag down of you trying to chase your goals, and then, like I said, who you surround yourself with really makes a difference. Um, you know how well you're gonna do. You know, like I said before, uh, bodybuilding is not a team sport, but yeah. you know your support system and like your loved ones. You know, your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it is. Like, you know, having a good group of people, you know, with you during that like that journey. It's just gonna make it's gonna make it so much better because then like when you finally have that victory or that whether win you get like you have people to celebrate it with you know yeah you know say you win that you win you win your pro card but you cut everybody out of your life it's like it's lot of tea I'm like I celebrate this way yeah <laughs> by myself I that more um, and I, I think that that's something that goes for anything in life is mm-hmm. having the right people around you 100%. but particularly with bodybuilding. And this is something that I kind of hammer home with Dash too. And something that I see, you know, in in the relationships he's had. You know, I mean, he's 14. He's still discovering all of that. And he's got a lot to learn. And yeah. and you and I both know he will experience all kinds of crazy shit when it comes to that. But the one thing I always say is, you know, I and, and I separate him from everybody else. And not so much in like, oh, well, you're special. I just say, hey, listen, if this is what you really want to do. Like you really want to be a pro, you really want to win Olympia, you really want to do this stuff, you can do it, but you got to have the right people around you too, you know, and you got to remain committed. And if you're around people that don't support you or don't get it, it's going to make it harder for you. It's going to make it almost impossible. Yeah. And I I feel like success, um, and I know that we, we talk about this as an individual effort, but there's also a team that's behind you mm-hmm. and those people support that individual effort. And I feel like you need, uh, you need a great trainer. You need the right people that love and support you and that will, uh, basically enable you. Yes. You know, I mean, I pay for gym memberships. I pay for training. I pay for food. I drive him to the gym. I drive him back. You know, I do all that stuff. We go to our class and we go to Olympia because for me, I'm like, I want to fuel that, you know, I want him to see. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like you get there. And the truth is like, I never, I I never envisioned that I would ever go to something like Arnold classic or Olympia Mm -hmm. in my life. But that's what kids teach you. You know, they show you who they are Mm -hmm. and you got to have a choice as a parent. You could say, well, that's just silly. I don't care about that. Or you can say, yeah, yeah. Right. Like you can just, or or you can say, well, that's just dumb. You want to go look at naked men Mm -hmm. on stage. And we joke about that all the time, but it's like, yeah, that's what it is, but it's it's a whole lot more, you know. But um, you know, I, I feel like you have to fuel that passion. It's one thing like with my dad, with my own with my art, you know, my dad was like my biggest fan. You know, he was like he and 
I remember one summer I went to uh, went to see him and he he worked at a, a Reaper graphics firm that did copies and shit. And I drew a whole comic. It was like one of my first ones. I colored it and everything. And he was like, all right. He's like, let's go print this thing. And we went after hours and he printed my comics in color, awesome. which I took back to me when I, when I went back to school and I sold them. Yeah. You know, people were excited and I, I thrived off of that. Like I saw it. I was like, wow, like this is, this cool, is great. Man. But like you have to have, I feel like, I'm not saying that you can't achieve greatness by, you know, on your own in terms of like, just struggling through it and making mm-hmm. it happen. Yeah. But you're doing it the hardest possible. Yeah. Way. That's like choosing to do it on hard mode. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. But why wouldn't you call your resources if you have them? Yes. But some people, like, you're just lucky. Like, you, you know, you have a good, you know, uh, set of parents you have, mm-hmm. or just people that are helping you out that can help guide you and, and, and at least at a minimum support that journey yes, that's and support you getting there. Most important part, like, Dash is so fortunate to have, you know, parents like you to fully support it you know especially yeah. for him knowing he wants to do such a young age and you being all in him like yeah hell yeah man fucking yeah. go for it you know like a lot of parents i feel like i'm not gonna speak for all parents but i think a lot of parents don't do that enough you know like they almost kind of pre-plan out it's like no you need to go to college and do this it's yeah like, well, what if they don't want to do that oh a lot of times like when parents try to force your kids to do something those kids lash out and don't do it and they're like resent towards their parents because like Absolutely. that's not what they want to do yeah. Like not everybody has to go to college and get some corporate job or some degree to do this. Like it's not meant for everybody. Yeah. You know, let them choose for themselves what they truly love to do and just fucking yeah. support it, you know? And like, you know, I would not be able to do what I do without my wife. Like she does so much for me behind the scenes. Like I, I can't thank her enough for what she's done for me. Like during this bodybuilding thing, yeah. it goes for anybody that wants to pursue bodybuilding. You got to find the right partner. That's going to understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of heartache, a lot of stress. Like, it's it's rough. It's well, let's, let's talk about that for a second because – and I did want to bring that up because um, your wife, Latina, mm-hmm. she's also – she competes as well, right? Like, and she, she trains. She's into it. She's, you know, she's a – I mean, I see her at Refinery almost as much as I see you, mm-hmm. you know? And, like, this is someone that um, – and you guys met at the Air Force? Is that yeah, right? we met in the military. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Was she into bodybuilding at that time? Like, would you guys not said really? That? No, no. So she worked out obviously, but you know, we started dating when I was doing my first prep, and she kind of just you know came to my first show, and she kind of she kind of she kind of get more into it. Like, oh, yeah. I think I want to try it. She no longer competes anymore. Excuse me. Um, you know, she's decided to go ahead and take a step back, and you know, try to support me as best she can, which sure. I'm super grateful for. You know, I've. I never asked her to do that and I would never do that. You know, I always tell her like, I want you to have like a passion and like a love for what you do. Like I have with bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't want it to just be me and like, I'm happy I'm doing this. Like I want you to have the same feeling I'm getting. So, you know, she actually just got a part-time job as a victim's advocate over at Pleasant Grove uh, Police Department. Oh, that's so this was She worked yeah, yeah. for, yeah, she worked for OSI in the military. So it's like the office, office of special investigations for the military. She worked with sexual assault victims. So she's super passionate about, you know, just... Well, that's amazing. Yeah, about stuff like that. So she got a job at uh, Pleasant Grove as a victim's advocate. And she just loves it, man. She truly... Like, I, when she comes home, she just can't wait to tell me about what, what her yeah, day consists of. And I, lo- I love seeing that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so she took a step back from competing so she can fully support me and what I'm doing. And, you know, like I said, I'm super grateful for that. Never asked her to do it. But, you know, it's what she wants to do. And, man, she's found something that she's really passionate about still. Yeah. And she's able to do that. So that's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, you know, as someone that's, <laughs> I've been married almost 20 years of my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not to the same person, but um, I've always had support uh, from my partners. And that was always something that... Uh, it was a precursor to everything. Like, I mean, it was or not a precursor, but rather a um, condition. Yeah. Um, you just, I, I don't think you can have a healthy relationship, let alone a healthy career. If you don't have that person that you're spending a majority of your time with, yeah. if they're not a hundred percent on board with what you're doing, bro, it ain't gonna happen. it's not going to work. It's, it's 1, just not, not gonna work. like you're going to have to let go of either your dream or that yeah. person. Yeah, that really is what it's going to come it down to. You're going to have to drop one of those things, the dream or the person, because if they're not in alignment, it's, it's going to go down. It's not going to work. And then it's like, say you do drop the passion for the person. Now, guess what? You're going to build a resentment towards them. You're going to hate them. And you're, not, you're probably not going to last because you're going to hate each other yeah. because of what she made you choose. So, you know? yeah. And I think, you know, in that way, it's like, it's what I tell Dash. I'm like, you know, you're 14. 
you know, he's getting ready to go to high school now. Um, because they only they only do three year high schools here. I don't yeah, know if that's like, about that. that was weird. It's so yeah. strange to me, but it is what it is. So, <laughs> but he's getting ready to go into high school, and you know, I'm positive he'll meet other girls, you know, because he is interested and stuff. But, um, I, I, I just hope, and that's always my my greatest hope is that, you know, he finds a person similar to Latina in that way, in that somebody that is aligned with what he's doing. Because if he doesn't, that's where my concerns come in. Where it's like, because you and I both know how powerful, you know, that can be yeah. when you meet somebody, especially yes. when you're younger, and you, you know, you fall in love, and and you know the, the the lust aspect kicks in, and you're like, it's suddenly it's easy to like push things to the yeah, side. That, that is scary to think about. You know? And it's very scary because you know when you're young and you're still figuring things out, you know, it's a little easier to say, ah, fuck it. Yeah. Ah, and I'm just like, ah. Mm-hmm. But like, as you get older, you're like, like for me right now, like I've been working on this this book uh, for the better part of a decade. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been, I'm at the end. I'm like, why? <laughs> nothing on this, on this earth except a heart attack or aneurysm or me just dropping fucking dead would stop me from finishing. Mm-hmm. You know, because like you get to that point and you're just like, ain't nothing going to change. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, you could serve up whatever the fuck you think is going to distract me. It's not going to matter. Mm-hmm. Like, too old or too far gone. Yeah. It's not going to happen. But when you're young, you're like, more easy. easily swayed. Yeah, you're like, ah, yeah, yeah. Like that shit ain't more. Yeah. Man, you work so hard. You cut so far. You really didn't do yeah. that, man. Like, you fucking love doing this. And you're going to quit for this girl. You're probably going to break up with them for years, you know? <sighs> yeah. So that's, you know, for me, that's one of my fears. But I feel like, again, this is where it comes in as a parent where you're like, I can have some influence here. Yes. I can, I can take him to these shows. I can pay for his training, you know, a good gym and keep that fire burning. So that when things do get to a point where it's like, he may be thinking like, oh, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, you do. Yeah. Or you get him to a point where he's not going to think that, mm-hmm. you know, because he's so dialed in. Yeah. I feel like, you know, again, like you talk about when I was a kid, I've I'm, I'm drawn since I could hold Korean. Mm-hmm. And I remember telling when I was a, a teenager in high school, I told my mom, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I want to be a comic artist. I said, that's what I want to do. And I got the kind of, you know, well, that's nice, but... Yeah. You know, like I didn't have that. Well, let's go to Comic Con. Yeah. Let's let's find artists that we could link you up to that can be mentors and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like, let's. What do you need? I didn't get that. It's like, well, that's nice. You can do that on the side, but you have to think about. It. Yeah. Oh, what do you need to do for real? What's your, what's your career going to be? What's your fucking fluorescent light draining yeah. cubicle bullshit yeah. job going to be? What's it going to be your fucking punishment for like, 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 Oh man. fuck! But you know, I honestly, like, I'm proud of myself because I, mean, I think a lot of it is just who I who I am. Dude, I, I, I'm just fuck. Like, I've always done what I'm going to do. Me too. I you know, people tell me things, like, even when I joined the military, but they're like, like, why do you want to go and be in the infantry? Why don't you just join the Air Force? Would it be easy? Yeah. Right? And I was <laughs> like, I got to find out, man. Yeah. I got to know this answer. I want to do this, dude. I got to know, yeah. you know? Um, I joined to go to war. I yeah. was like, this is why I'm here, mm-hmm. you know? And I think back, like, where the Gulf War started. I remember watching... The news, they're showing the planes take off and everything. And I remember, I can't explain it. I just remember watching it thinking, I wish I was there. Yeah. But I was too young. I was 13, 12. And I was like, I I can't tell you why I wanted to be there. I can't tell you why I wanted to be in a fight. I didn't really really understand the fight. I just wanted to be there. Yeah, you can't explain so much. I was just like, I I wish I was there. And then like I knew after 9-11, I knew we were going to go to war. And I was like, I was 24. And I just knew. I was like, I don't do this now. Mm -hmm. Never yeah, and I was talking to um, what's his name, dude with the mullet, the, the mustache, Travis. Travis. Yeah, I was talking to Travis, he, and he's a marine, and he was saying how he's like, you know, he he did four years ago. He was like, yeah, he's like, you know, being in I mean, it's not wartime, it's boring. It sucks, yeah. You know, it's like it's it's not fun. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, I I, I, I agree. I mean, I would agree if that were the case. I remember I got to my unit to the final first. I remember I got there uh, in October. And all the guys that had been there for about a year or so, they're like, oh, man, you got a lot to do. Summers come around, we're like fishing. It's like, that's your place of duty is to be out like fishing and having fun and do, we don't do shit, blah, blah. And I was like, what? They literally, <laughs> like the next day, like, yeah, we're going to NTC. And then we're going to NTC again. Then we're going to Fort Knox. Then we're going to Afghanistan. And I was like, 
this like fishing summer of like fun and hanging out and just bullshit never fucking happened. <laughs> we were always deployed, whether it was real world or training. Yeah, non fucking side. So I never got to experience that. But you know, I, I feel know. like though you look. That's that's a. I'm not gonna say it's a good thing. No, it is. But like, yeah, because like I fucking loved my job when I was deployed. When I'm home stationed and we're just like doing training stuff. Oh, being home is the worst. Fucking stupid. Man. I don't want to do this. Dude. But like, I don't know if it's like a good or bad thing to say, but like, I like. I love being deployed. I don't know what it is. Life is it. easier when you're deployed. Life is easy. It's like, easier because you you have a purpose. Yes. You know what you're there for. You got you know where your food's coming from. Mm-hmm. You know where you're going to bed, and you know that you're going to be there for a specified amount of time. Mm-hmm. And you you're not worried about bills. Nope. You're not worried about you know maintaining a car or doing That's anything. It. You're literally there for that. You're there, you're there to fucking fight a war. And, and yeah, you might die. <laughs> and people are trying to kill you. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially in my job and people shooting at us trying to yeah. blow us up every day but it's like it's weird because you know your place yes you know 100%. and I think kind of dialing in on that on any career really is just like if you can focus yourself to just that job I think that with bodybuilding drawing if anything uh, I feel like you can help you get there you that was a percent I totally agree Um, so I want to get to the, the wisdom part of this because you know, this is an industry package of wisdom, and I kind of like coin this term. If somebody else has, they can sue me. Uh, but because I think about it, because I, I read a lot of books, I read, I, you know, I, I take in a lot of like, I, I'm fascinated by knowledge, I'm fascinated by wisdom, and you know, I feel like there's things that we carry with us that we hold as like the truest things, mm. you know. Um, and I call it repackaged wisdom because I don't think that we've there's no new wisdom that's going to come around. It's like humanity has existed long enough that we've kind of covered all the bases. We just got to repackage it. Yeah. You know, we take things that people have said before and we kind of make it our own. So I'm curious what wisdom for you, what are some of the things that you carry with you all the way up to now and then into Olympia uh, come this fall? Like what are the things that you carry with you that are very important and essential as wisdom? That's a deep one. It's um, super deep. <laughs> I'm sure there's some things that I just kind of do subconsciously. Like, I'm not just, like, always thinking, like, oh, this is some wisdom I carry through all the time. But, um, you know, one thing I try to always, I just try to live my life like this. You know, like, you can't control what's going to happen in your life. You know, I try to live my life as stress-free as possible. And just, like, I, I know I cannot control the majority of things that's probably going to happen in life. You know, but what you can't control is, like, how you handle it. How you handle it. But, like, how, how are you going to handle it emotionally? You know, you're going to freak out and just fucking say, oh, fuck this, you know, like, whatever, it's over. This happened, so I can't do this now. Or you're going to be like, all right, dude, well, I just lost my job. But, you know, I'm still going to make something happen. I'm still going to do it. I still got to figure something out. I got to do it. Um, you know, that's one thing I try to pride myself on and just, I want to just call this wisdom. But, you know, I try to, I try to carry myself in a very humble way. You know, like, people, especially now, you know, when I got my pro card and I'm going to the Olympia now, people, like, Almost, I'm not gonna say they really, uh, what's the word, flatter me, I guess. They're like, oh, dude, like, it's like you're, you're, you're going to the Olympia, like, you're an Olympian, like, like, you're so fucking cool, or like this and that. I'm like, I don't look at things like that. Like, I don't think anybody in this world, no matter what title, what status you have, I don't think anybody's better than anybody else. You know, so I really try to carry myself like that. Like, I don't think I'm anybody special. You know, like, I'm just me, Nick Joyner, like, just chasing his dreams and doing what I love to do. Like, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't have this ego. I don't have this thing where like, oh yeah, like I'm. I'm fucking better. Than you. I don't think like that at all ever. Yeah. And I think there's too much of that, especially in bodybuilding. Um, you know, I do. I do admire. Um, you know, the whole art and practice of stoicism. You know, like you said before, like wisdom or but humanity's been around for a long time. Yeah. So it kind of just covered all the bases. So, but like we're still using terms and knowledge from those guys back in the Stoic area. Yeah. You know, using their things and like living life by like that, and I, I do like how the Stoics live their life. Um, you know, about just being really in control of your emotions, and you know, one thing that really I really enjoyed, or something I really resonate with, is like you know, once you accept the fact that you know you are going to die and you're not scared of death, then you're truly going to start living. Yeah, you know, like you can die tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised, man. So like, why waste time doing things that you don't want to do? Yeah, to come absolutely. down to like, like example is like doing a job you fucking hate doing. Why waste your time doing it? Yeah, 
why are you making excuses like oh you know like it's comfortable like oh, what else am i gonna do who knows what do you like to do like what is your passion and like yeah. you you're so limited on time in this world like you think you have a lot but you don't you don't have a lot at all you're not gonna get it back this yeah. this is the most precious currency we have is fucking time dude so why waste a second of it doing something you don't like to do you know find a passion find a dream put everything you have into it every single day and just do the best you can man love every second of it yeah you know because yeah. it's gonna be gone it's not promised tomorrow one here gets out alive no, so exactly. we're we're all gonna we're all gonna bite the bucket one way or another kick the bucket i'm not gonna bite a bucket yeah. um but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all destined for the same destination one way or another at one time or another. And I don't know. I, I feel like if we all knew the day and time we were going to die, we'd just fixate on that all the time. That. That would yeah, it would be awful. awful. I would never want to know that, you know, but I know that it's going to happen. Like you can't, <laughs> like, you, there's nothing you could do. No. So yeah, I think that, you know, ultimately embracing and, and seizing the day as it were. Uh, is essential, you know? And yeah, I mean, I, I think one of those things too, which kind of going back to the, the bodybuilding and fitness thing is, you know, I never expected Dash uh, to want to become a bodybuilder, but I told him early on, you know, and he's seen me go to the gym, you know, uh, four or five times a week. And I was just said, you know, I told him, I was like, and I knew in my head, because I didn't want him to, to follow down my path, you know, because I was like, again, I was like the fat kid in school mm -hmm. until I decided not to be. Yeah. And I didn't want him to ever experience that. And what's been interesting is now, see, he has like the physique and the training and everything that I would have killed for at that age. Oh, 14, hell yeah, yeah. dude. To look like him at 14 going to high school, like that would have been amazing. Love that. And so like for me, I feel like I broke that chain because that's not who I was at 14 yeah. in high school, you know? And so I'm very proud of like that progress. And, you know, just like the humility that you have, he he mirrors that, you know? And he mirrors a lot from you in that regard too. And he's like, Dash doesn't walk around with an ego. No. He doesn't walk around. And, and I asked him about it the other day. I was like, you know, to, to you know, because actually he went to school wearing a t-shirt. He never does that because he's always like, Pump covered, you know? <laughs> and so even with the t-shirt, I was like, so did everybody like say stuff or, you know, just go wearing a t-shirt to school? He's like, yeah. He's like, you know, some people, you know, and I'm like, well, what did they say? He's like, oh, you know, they say stuff. He's like, but I don't like, I don't ever like make a big show. Of yeah. Let it go to his head. Yeah. He's like, cause and I think that is something that he's aware of. It's good to be, again, what I say is like surrounded with people. You got to get a good trainer. You got to get somebody, not just somebody's going to teach you how to build your body, but also your mind. mind. That's the important part. Yeah. And, and I know that what's good, what's you know fulfilling for me is to see that he takes those lessons, you know. Um, but yeah, like it's pretty it's pretty cool to see him embrace this journey in that way. But ultimately, what I'm happy to see is that he's embraced the fact that you're gonna have to work out for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. whether you're a bodybuilder, whether you're just whether you're a CrossFitter, whether whatever the fuck, it doesn't matter. If you don't, and I say this all the time, this is my repackaged wisdom, or maybe I created it, I don't know. <laughs> I did. I didn't, I guarantee you. Somebody <laughs> smarter people than me have already said it, but like I, I, I do always say or echo that if you don't work out now, eventually you're gonna go to a doctor and they're gonna tell you, you have to start working out start if you wanna keep staying alive. Um, and you see that a lot. Like I see like, uh, you don't see it at refinery, but you'll see it at the, the Globo gyms is you'll see like older folks coming in, you know, and they're working out for the first time in their late sixties or seventies. And it's like, you, like, it's good that you're there. It really is. But man, could you imagine if you had started you're like 40 years late, bro? Yeah. Like, and you don't have to go, you don't have to be Nate Joyner. No. You know, he is an outlier. Then you are. You're an outlier. Like, there's what, 14 names going to Olympia? Is that something like that? Uh, like right now, yeah. Like, something like that. But there's, there's more shows. That's 14 people out of 7 billion on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a huge thing. But you don't have to be that in order to go work out. But you're going to have to go work out, man. Like, people be healthier. I mean, like, people have a misconception. A misconception. Of like what it takes to like be healthy. You work out two or three times a week for like forty five minutes. That's all you need, man. Yeah. You know, you watch what you eat. You know, you walk around, get some movement in, stop being so stagnant. Yep. That's all you need to be healthy. You don't have to go in there and lift a bunch of weight and get fucking jacked. 
you know, the whole, I mean, it doesn't happen. I don't hear it as much anymore. People are like, yeah, I don't want to get too big. They want to do that. I'm like, man, I've been trying to get too big for, I can't even tell you how long. It doesn't just happen like that. Like, it's hard to get big. Yeah. You know? So it's like, it doesn't take, you know, the, the thought that you have, what it takes to be healthy and like have a decent physique. It's not, it's not that. It's not that hard. Yeah. You know, it just takes a little bit of discipline. Yeah. That's all it is. Discipline, consistency, moderation, yeah. all those things. Exactly. I feel That's like where you have, can have the balance. Yeah. You know, if you're just trying to be a healthier person. I feel like most people know. Yes. They know what they need to do. Still want to do it. They all know what they're doing wrong. They all know what they need to do right. Mm-hmm. And they just don't do it. Just don't do it. Yeah. Until they get that, that, that talk with their doctor. Yeah. Until they hey, man, the you're, you're like, pre-diabetic and you probably got about five years until you die. Yeah. Like that's your wake up call. Now, now you want to be healthy. Dude, you, you could have been doing this like 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. You know? And that's actually what happened to my dad. My dad was like a big guy when he got to college. Mm-hmm. He like put on a bunch of weight and he got really big. And the doctors told him like, if you don't lose weight, you're going to die. You're going to die, yeah. And my dad was, that's that scared him straight. Yeah. His ass was running around the running around the block. Um, and he lost all the weight, got fit. And he, he actually was one of the first people to introduce me to bodybuilding when I was a kid, he was doing all the shit. Like he's posing. I remember him posing in the mirror and shit. And I was just like, I had no awareness of yeah. it, you know? And I was just, and I was like, oh, you really like this stuff, huh? And my dad just, he, I remember him laughing. He's like, oh, I love it. And he's like, you know, this is amazing. Yeah. You know? And he was really strict with it for a while. And then he got older and, you know, stopped giving a shit as much. And, yeah. um, and that was that. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, fitness is just a lifelong journey. I think that everybody, yeah, it's not just, just like accept a, it. Yeah, it's not just like a diet for three months. Like, no, dude, like do this for the rest of your life. And then when you get older, you will thank yourself. You are literally putting money in the bank in your twenties, thirties, forties, fifties. So when you're older, like your sixties, seventies, like you, you're you're taken care of. Like you're yeah. healthy. You know, you've taken care of yourself your whole life, so you don't have to worry about these these other things that other people have to worry about. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to a, a military repackage wisdom, which is. If you take care of your equipment, take your equipment's going to take care of you. Exactly. Very simple. 100%. Um, so uh, the last thing that I wanted to cover just real quick, and, and it kind of goes along with what we're talking about now, is you know, what advice um, do you give to people overall in general in terms of like fitness? What is your, what's your big fitness advice for people? Fitness? Just like being fit, being healthy. Like what, what is like... What's kind of like some of your key points as far as that goes? Like, I think a big thing is, you know, a lot of people, they want to get fit. Um, you know, we live in this era now where we have like the answers to everything in the poll right now. You have a fucking cell phone. Oh, like, yeah. They're in it. So it's like, people are like, yeah, I just don't know where to start. Or they overthink it. Or they're asking a billion people for like, wait, what should I do? How should I do this? Do your own research, man. Do your own due diligence, okay? Like, it's not, nothing wrong with asking for help asking for advice but at the end of the day like you're in charge of yourself like your health is your health yeah do a little bit of research and you know and then when you actually start diving into it you'll figure out like it's not that hard or as complicated as you think it is i mean at first it can be a little overwhelming like would you just understand the 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 basics of it okay how do i lose weight oh eat or eat less or just be in a caloric deficit you know what i mean yeah like uh like burn more than i'm bringing in that's all it is like if you're if you're eating two thousand calories a day and you're not losing any weight, what do you do? Drop it. Drop it by two three hundred calories. Eat seventeen hundred calories a bit. Yeah. You know, and then you got to be patient with it too. Like patience is the biggest thing when it comes to this, is being patient, and having delayed gratification. Yeah. You know, I think that's a big issue right now nowadays is the instant gratification. You know? Well, now yeah, like everybody's like, oh, I'll just, I'll just go on Ozempic. Yeah. It's like we well, have to stay on Ozempic for the rest of your life. That and you're gonna it's 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 a weight loss thing, but you're also gonna lose. You need muscle. Like the more muscle you have, the more your body just burns naturally. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, and you want muscle because as we get as you get older, that's gonna protect you. It's gonna you know give you thicker bones. It's gonna it's gonna it's just gonna keep you healthier yeah. as you get older. You want to be that old dude walking around with the fucking hunchback and like can't get off the couch <laughs> and can't stay. You don't want to be that guy. So it's like just be patient and understand like you're not gonna get fucking jacked in four or five months yeah like it just takes time well and and i think the one other thing that i would i'd like to add to that and 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 get your perspective too is that um dieting in general i think is completely misunderstood Mm -hmm. like a diet is how you eat Mm -hmm. like people say oh i'm going on a diet i mean it's kind of 
it doesn't really make any sense. Well, it's a nonsense. Nice. Oh, you're gonna you're going to eat stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a diet. What people have to look at is that if you you can lose weight by going on a quote unquote diet, meaning you've restricted foods and all this other stuff. But if your intent is to go back to those foods after you've lost the weight that you wanted to lose or whatever, it's just going to come back. It's no point. It's good. You're gonna. It's going to be even worse when it comes back to where you started. So ultimately, like. I mean, what what I think people need to understand is that if, and you can back me up on this or not, is that if you're going to be on a diet, it needs to be for life. A sustainable one. It has to be sustainable. It has to be something that you're like, I can do this until I cease to draw breath. Mm -hmm. Because if it's something you're like, ah, do it for a little while, and then I was going to bring back the burgers and pizza and ice cream and all that other shit all the time. Yeah. Nothing says you can't have that stuff, but it has to be within moderation. Moderation. Yeah. Yes. But you still have to find a consistent diet. So like for me, like you came here today and I was cooking my, my sweet potatoes, getting ready my meal prep. I'm going to have sweet potatoes and uh, beef this week. And so I'll mix that together and I'll make my meals. And mm -hmm. the truth is, I love that. Like, yeah. I, sometimes I think, I'm like, oh, man, it's so boring. It's not a cheeseburger. It's yeah. not like some great thing. But the truth is, when I warm that stuff in the microwave and I sit down to eat it, it's not terrible. I'm not struggling to yeah. eat my sweet potato and beef little measured out thingies. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a, it's not terrible. And I think about it, and I'm like, I could do this forever. This is fine. Yeah. This is good. I'll still have a cheeseburger. I still have pizza. You understand how it works, though. You understand that, like, yeah, I can eat this and this and this, or, but then you know, once a week I can go and have this because you know how to find that balance and you you know how to accommodate accommodate your foods. I think a lot of people have a bad relationship with food. Absolutely. Like you were saying, you're like, oh, it's so boring though. It's not a cheeseburger. Yeah. Okay, but dude, you know what? Sometimes you're gonna you're gonna have to eventually learn. Like you're fueling your body with certain foods. You're not just eating for like, oh, it tastes good, so it like, gives me this like. This fucking dopamine hit, like, oh, this is so good. Yeah. But I guarantee you, 20 minutes later, you're like, fuck, I feel like shit. Yeah, it sucks. Blow it in your, uh, yeah, like, if you just understand, like, just macros, you know, how to how to balance foods out, like, you understand, like, what protein is and carbs and fats. Like, if you know how to do that, you can actually have a pretty diverse, exciting daily diet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you just, you have to learn that, put in the effort to learn how that works. Like, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to try, like, ah, it's too much work. Well, that's why you're going to go fucking eat cheeseburger, dude, because you're lazy. Yeah. You're lazy. Well, it's And it's easy. Yeah, right? Like, the truth is, it's easier to go and get a cheeseburger at McDonald's or something than yeah. it is to do meal prep. Yes. I chopped, I skinned chopped potatoes this morning, set the oven, put the spices and everything on them, put them in, cooked them, took them out. Yeah, it's easier to go get a cheeseburger. It's harder to do that. But the truth is, I'll have multiple meals made yeah. throughout the week. I just... Take them out, put it in the microwave for two minutes. I'm good to go. And you're gonna feel so much better. People don't realize how much better you feel once you cut the shit out of your diet and what you eat. Yeah. You're gonna realize how much better you feel. The mental clarity you have, like no, you're not as lethargic. You're not as bloated. You're not as inflamed. Like you're gonna feel ten times better. And you're like, wow. When I eat like this, I feel so much better. I don't even want to touch that pizza or that burger. Yeah. You know. Well, and the way you don't don't only feel good physically. But you feel better mentally. Yeah. Because you're like, you know, I just ate this and I didn't eat that. It's like a win. It's like, yeah. like you just, you just, you just prove to yourself like, oh, I have some yeah. discipline. Yeah. And like later on in the evening, let's say if you, if you were going to have like a little, you know, snack or something that mm -hmm. you otherwise, it's like, well, I ate good today. Like yeah. I didn't eat like complete shit. Mm -hmm. So I can have a little bit of this. Yeah. Whereas yeah, bar, if you bar. just eat like shit all day and then the nighttime comes like, well, let's keep this train going. Yeah, <laughs> like, going. Of course, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. And um, the only other, the other thing I would say about food too, um, is, you know, I think I grew up in a household where like my mom and bless her, like she just didn't know any better, but she used to buy like the snack size candy bar things, mm -hmm. you know. And she put them in a bowl, and they just, oh, they're always there. Yeah. It's always junk food in mm -hmm. my house uh, as a kid growing up. And I think one of those things, that's what we have now, is like, I don't buy that shit. Mm -hmm. I don't buy cookies. I don't buy ice cream. I mean, we did buy Girl Scout cookies recently, so that's a lie. But that's okay. Though. Traditionally, seasonal. Seasonal, exactly. <laughs> but traditionally, we don't keep junk food in the, junk house. Food in the house because I know myself. Like I, and I think that's another thing that people need to do as well is kind of have a come to Jesus with themselves and be like, know that if you buy this certain stuff and keep it in your home, you are going to eat it. Yeah. 
you know, you're, we all have moments of weakness. We all have those fuck it. We hit that fuck it button in our brain and we're just like, yeah. Going like you know? feral mode. Dude. Like I'm the same way. But if it's not there, it makes it that much easier for you to say no. That's because it's a right. pain in the fucking ass to get in your car and like, oh, I'm going to go drive to get it. And then during that drive, you're going to be thinking, you know what you're doing, man. Yeah. You're just going to get junk. You don't need it. You don't need it. But, and so like that makes it that much harder. So my advice to people that struggle with, you know, kind of maintaining that diet is don't keep it in the house. You could still go get it. But don't keep it in the don't house. Don't keep it in the house. Don't, if, if you open that pantry and all your dreams come true, yeah, that's, like, that's bad. The temptation's there. Like, I'm the same way. Like, I know myself to where, like, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm fucking disciplined. Like, I'm rock solid. Like, all day, every day. But if I have a bite of something or, like, I have one of those chips, dude, it just spirals. It's, yeah. But I know that. So, I, I know that. Like, no. Like, oh, you just want one? Like, no. Because I yeah. know myself. Because if I have one... Is there two, three? Next thing you know, I eat the whole bag of chips. Dude, I pass the chip out. Every, I never buy chips. The only time I buy chips is when I know we're going to make nachos because yeah, that's yeah. something we'll make sometimes. Yeah. If we're going to make nachos, we get it. But I never buy, I don't buy chips. Yeah. Otherwise, because I know what's going to happen. Yes. Like they're going to come out. They're going to haunt me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I can't just have one. So I was like, I, <laughs> as long as I don't have it, you can put donuts, whatever you want in front of my face all day. I'm like, I'm good. But as soon as I taste it. It's a wrap, dude. It's yeah. a fucking spiral. You put donuts in front of me, it's gonna be yeah. bad. It's, it's gonna be ugly. It's, it's gonna be ugly. Um, that is, uh, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you for coming out, uh, driving out, and jumping in the studio with me. This is our first studio show, which is really cool. So uh, Nate is our guinea pig for that, which is pretty awesome. Um, and. Uh, Nate is an amazing trainer. He works with my son and I've just seen an amazing transformation with him. Um, nobody believes he's <laughs> the age that he is. I, I still can't It's fucking it. crazy. It's crazy. I think I told him where Arnold, like, you know, I was getting my badge and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. You're 14. So you don't get a badge. Mm. And I was like, well, he's 14. And the guy that was, he's like, oh, right. Yeah, he's 14. And I was like, no, for real. He's 14. So Dash actually had to carry his, I made him carry his ID with him every time he went to the floor. Because multiple times they're like, oh, where's his badge? Where's his, I was like, he's 14. And they're like. Yeah, okay, buddy. Like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, for real, he's 14. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been amazing with him working with you. It's been such a a great transformation for him and such a positive influence. So, you know, thank you for that. And, you know, it's, it's difficult. And I think that everybody needs the right mentors. Mentors are so essential and important. And so I'm just glad that he has you for that. Glad that we found you. Um, and that it's, it's just been great. It's been a great working uh, relationship and, and training relationship has been awesome. So yeah. I, I've, I've enjoyed every second of it, man. I'm almost honored to have the, the opportunity to kind of be that person for him. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's, 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 I'm grateful for it because now I was like, you know, I can, it's hard to like re- remember he is 14 years old. You know, <laughs> really dude, it's like, it's good because like you said, I can be a mentor to him and I can help him, you know, through the mistakes I made on yeah. um, bodybuilding is like, I can kind of push him away from that. I mean, obviously I still think people should make certain mistakes and kind of learn as they go, like learn from their mistakes, like a trial and error type thing. But I can lead him and guide him the best way I possibly can to, not make certain mistakes that I did. Yeah. So where you can almost like shorten the journey. Like I feel like I could have shortened my process, my, my journey to turning a pro by two or three years had I taken it more seriously and just kind of locked it in earlier instead of doing the whole bro diet bullshit of like, <laughs> oh, dude, you just got to gain weight. Like, <laughs> yeah, 250, but I'm fucking like 22% body fat. You know? like, <laughs> so, but no. No, it's, it's, it's been an honor, man. Like, I, it's crazy how it's, it's, You've done a great job, you know, being his dad and supporting him. Like he's, it's crazy to see how good of a head uh, he has on his shoulders. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, insane. yeah, and and that makes me, it makes me happy. It makes me proud to see him doing that. And I'm always going to be kind of, you know, a little nervous, Nelly, as a dad too, because like I think every parent is yeah, the same in that way. You're like, you're like, God damn, I just want the best for him. But you know, people are going to people, you know, and, and ultimately, kids are always going to show you who they are. But you know, it. I, I've always felt that this was an essential part to his growth and I'm just glad that he's on the path that he is, uh, that he is on. And, you know, you're, you'll be hardwired into, into his DNA forever at this point, you know, like he's always going to, that means a lot. He's always going to be, no matter where he goes in life, you know, and especially 
you know, where I see him going and, and I do see him, you know, taking the stage at some point, it's, it's always going to be one of those attributes. Like if he's sitting down doing a, a podcast with some jackass one day, he's going to be like, yeah, he's like, man, Nate Joyner, I trained with him. He's a fucking, you know, did all this for me and trained me and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, and I think this is how we give back to the world. Yes. You know, it's like, and it's a unique way for us to do that as parents, as trainers, as whatever, you know, we can reshape things where it didn't really work out for us in some ways, or we learned the hard way we could pass that on. And I feel like ultimately that's kind of what makes the world a better place. You know, it's like in, in these small moments, you know, we, we tend to think like, Oh, politicians are going to make the world a better place. Like, no, man, that's not where, that's not where it happens. You know, it happens. <laughs> yeah. It, it happens at this level, you know, it happens at just what you do as a parent, what you do for your job, what your, where your passions are. And I think that's where you can have, a real effect on the world. So, um, Nate, where can people find you if they want to find you social media or wherever? Um, so yeah, I have Instagram. That's pretty much my only, I'm not on TikTok or on yeah. Instagram is a, oh, see, I don't even know my Instagram is Nate J. I, <laughs> I used to know it, but I changed it. Did I, I forget mine too. Sometimes yeah. I got to go on. I'm like, is it Arctic Ninja or is it Arctic Ninja? Paul, what did I sell oh. on? Yeah. It's always uh, something. So, Nady J underscore IFBB. That's my Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel that I post on there weekly. So, if you guys want to check that out, just search Nate Joyner yeah. on you on YouTube. So, lots of good videos. I've checked them out. Um, those are actually, they're pretty fun. I try to make them more like, loose. Like there, there is some training in there. Um, but a lot of it's just me kind of, me and my training partner and my camera guy just like yeah. some banter, try to keep entertaining. You know, we drop some, some knowledge bombs and some ranting and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's not just... It's fun. They're fun. I Yeah, yeah. I was watching the one where you guys went... Where you got your, your birthday one where you got surprised. Yeah. You guys are going bowling. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, those are fun. And, you know, I, I'm trying to help steer Dash into that too. But also, I don't want him to get started too early because mm -hmm. I don't want him to, like, deal with that. But it's I rough, feel like... You know, but I'm taking... The, again, it's like, you know, we've learned the harder lesson. So now this is where we can kind of... I could say, look, man, let's not prioritize that right now. Let's prioritize... Your fitness. Let's, let's prioritize what's going to make you yes. uh, someone to be there, mm -hmm. you know? So cool. Well, um, Nate, it's uh, been great to have you. Great chat. I hope that uh, everybody listening has gotten some kind of uh, some repackaged wisdom that you can maybe fold into your own life. Um, and more than anything, if you are somebody that is struggling with going to the gym or if you're somebody that is like dead set on becoming a competitor, hopefully this has helped give you some insight and some perspective. Uh, Nate, thank you again. Awesome having you. And I'll see your ass at the gym. Yeah, hey man. But I just want to say thank you for having me here, man. Super, super grateful to be on this podcast. I, enjoy, I really enjoy doing these things. And, you know, I love, I love talking about stuff like this. So, yeah. um, and like you were saying, anybody out there struggling with like gym stuff, when you go to the gym, do not hesitate to talk to the biggest guy in there. Because a lot of times they look intimidating, but they're the most nicest people and the most willing to help you out. <laughs> yeah. There's like those memes where it shows, this is like the biggest guy in the gym yeah. is like a monster that like when he talks and yeah, it's like a little teddy bear. bear. No, yeah. Really. I don't, I don't look but come talk to me. I'm very, very nice. Like, yeah. Super nice. I think that's an out, out, uh, an outstanding point is, yeah, if you're, if you are there and you are just like overwhelmed, dude, talk to the people that look like they go there yes. all the time. They'd be more than happy to help you. Yeah. That's the truth. 100%. All right. Cool. Well, thanks buddy. Yeah, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. Peace. Peace. So much awesome information and perspective from Nate, as I knew there would be. Uh, make sure to give him a follow on his Insta and YouTube channels and cheer him on this October when he takes the stage at Mr. Olympia. Uh, now, for my own fitness tips and tricks for going to the gym. So, to be clear, I do not have Nate Joyner's physique. Uh, I don't have a six-pack, nor do I have a roadmap of veins on display, just a few, but at least they're noticeable. Um, I am in this for the lifestyle for the fitness and every now and again, yes, I will push myself and challenge myself uh, to look a specific way. But mostly I'm just trying to stay healthy. Uh, for many of you who are working jobs, maintaining a marriage, raising kids, uh, or just in a relationship, while also trying to achieve whatever passion goals you may have, getting to the gym, eating right, and staying fit is a monumental challenge. I get it. I've been there. I'm still there. Uh, but there are many ways to work these things into your life. So here are my tips and tricks broken down simply. Apply them if they sound good to you. And of course, 
consult a physician <laughs> before taking the advice of anyone on the internet. That includes me. All right, let's get into it. Number one, this is the most important one. Accept that fitness is a part of life, like brushing your teeth, sleeping, eating, and breathing. Accept that it is forever. There is no short term with fitness. You should plan on working out until the day you die. The work is never done. Uh, if you park your car, this is my analogy, if you park your car in the driveway and you never drive it again, it will rust and it will fall apart, <laughs> being neither utilized or maintained. It becomes a heap of junk. And the same is true for our bodies, these vessels that carry us through life. It's your life's ride, uh, and it needs to be used, maintained, regulated, and cared for. So th think of it this way. If you don't start working out now, eventually a doctor will tell you that you have to start working out just to improve or sustain your life. And by then you'll be too far down the path of, of bad habits and just general bad health, that's not gonna do much good. So start now where you stand and never stop. Number two, always have a plan. Don't walk into the gym, whether you're a seasoned pro or someone that's just coming in for the first time in years, don't go in without a plan. Show up knowing what you're going to do completely. That means finding a program or trainer ahead of time not as you walk through the door. If you show up knowing what you need to do, you'll get it done. If you show up with no agenda or plan, you'll spend most of your time doing things that you don't need to do, don't know how to do, and probably shouldn't do. Then you'll leave early, feeling like you wasted your time, you won't feel like you did anything, and you probably won't come back. It's very simple. We all know this, and this is a little repackaged wisdom. Fail to plan, plan to fail. Get a program, get a trainer, and show up ready to work. Okay, number three, pack a gym bag. Put a change of shoes, a towel, uh, a change of clothes, soap, brushes, wrist straps, headphones, water, water bottle, uh, energy drinks, supplements, whatever you need to show up. Do the work, shower, and car pay the motherfucking DM. It's not just about having the things you'll need for a successful workout. It's also a symbol of your dedication to doing it. Having the bag means you have everything you need to succeed and it eliminates excuses to not go to the gym. The bag represents in many ways your own dedication to staying on track. Number four, patience. If you're trying to lose weight, don't expect instant results after one week or even one month of showing up. Let's say you show up three days a week. That's 12 workouts per month at about an hour or so each. If you think that's enough to see dramatic results in a month, then you are sorely mistaken. It takes consistency, it takes dedication, and persistence to see dramatic results. And it happens over many, many months or years, not overnight. The same can be said for building muscle, although those results tend to come a, a tad faster. But uh, yet another kind of repackaged wisdom thing here is, you know, you have to accept that it took time to put it on, it's gonna take time to, to, keep, to get it off. It's not something that's just gonna happen because you decided to start going to the gym. That's the first step, the journey of a thousand miles. Number five, meal prep. Oh yes, the dreaded meal prep. Carving out an hour or so, usually or so, <laughs> To make meals for the week sounds positively dreadful on a Sunday night as you try to relax and, you know, you're, you're trying to squeeze in all this, you know, relaxation time before you got to go back to work, get back into the work week. You got to get your kids got to get their shit together for the for the school week. Try and grab some time with your with your significant other. It seems impossible, but it's not. It's so very, very simple, but we overcomplicate it. You don't need to. Listen, buy some chicken breasts, some lean beef, steaks, fish, shrimp, whatever protein source, you know what they are. The, one of the things that I, that I always see and that I know is that 
We all know truly deep down at this point that the base level knowledge of what we should and should not be eating. We know it. Nobody's putting a cinnamon roll in their mouth and thinking, yeah, this is good. It's actually pretty good for me. No, 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 no. You just, you wanted to feel good. You wanted to kick out those endorphins in your brain. And dude, I get it. I love cinnamon rolls. Uh, but you can't, you can't have cinnamon rolls every day. You shouldn't. I would love to, but you know, no, it's just, it's just not realistic, you know? Um, so get one of those sources of protein and partner it up with some vegetables and some kind of starch. Uh, you can do rice, white rice, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes. It doesn't matter. Measure it out so that you're not having like some ridiculous portion. And again, we all know this, you know, if you don't have a, a scale, just use the reference of the palm of your hand, put this much protein and this much carbs, both into a little plastic bin and that's your lunch or dinner or both. Once you have those things, just experiment, okay? Experiment. Look for recipes and dishes uh, from trusted resources. They're all over the internet. You can look at influencers, you can look at pros, uh, you can look and see what, uh, what they're eating and how they're eating it, how they're uh, uh, portioning it out, whatever works. Uh, figure out what you like and what you can eat for an extended period of time. And by that, I mean forever. I know that sounds crazy, but this is what, this is what happens with diets. I hate the word diets because a diet is just how you eat. A diet is not a, a weight loss thing. It's just how you eat. So this is a thing that happens for a lot of people when they go on a diet and they have dramatic weight loss results because they, they lose a lot of weight. They see those results and They've done it by severely restricting their calories and all this other stuff. I know because I've done this, but I did it when I was very young, <laughs> which is helpful and beneficial. But as you get older, it's not as easy to do this, that kind of stuff, these extreme diets. But what ends up happening is people will eat correctly for, an, for a certain period of time. And then when it's over and they feel like they've lost the weight that they wanted to lose and they look the way they want to look, they're like, okay, well... Back to the way I was eating before and start eating my junk. And what ends up happening, and there's numerous studies uh, that have been done on this, is that people start eating the way they ate before. They stop exercising. And what ends up happening is they put on more weight than they had before. And you see that with a lot of people that go through these yo-yo yo -yo, uh, situations is they, they can't sustain anything because they're doing it all in short spurts. There is no sustainability. Everything is done, well, I'll just have to do this for a little bit. And I can go back to eating shit. When I say you got to figure out what you can eat in terms of, you know, meal prep meals, let's say it's just breakfast and lunch or breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever the case may be, whatever meals you're prepping, it should be stuff that you're like, when you're eating, you're like, I could eat this for the rest of my life. And I've done that multiple times. I'll be eating my chicken and rice. You may think, oh my God, chicken and rice is terrible. But you know what? I put some sriracha in there. I put a little, little bit of the, uh, the, the spicy ranch in there, just a little bit. I don't flood it. You know, don't let it swim in that stuff. You can use pretty much any sauce that you want. Just enough to give it a little spike in flavor. Use spices by all means. You know, those are good. Uh, very low calorie, if any. Uh, and put those in there. And I'm telling you, you'll, I, I've eaten it. And I'm like, a lot of times you, you pull it out of the fridge like, ugh, I gotta eat my meal prep. And you start eating it. And you're like, actually, this is pretty delicious. Like, this is really good. I can eat this forever. And that is kind of the mindset you have to look at is what is something that you can eat forever? What is something, a meal, even if it's just like one or two different meals, you know, we, we tend to get wrapped up in this thing like, oh, I got to be trying new things and I need all the spice and variety for my life. I need to eat all of this stuff. No, you don't. You're going to anyways, but you don't need it like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you don't need to have new foods every single day. You don't have to be going out and seeking out every little thing that gives you like, you know, that endorphin rush of like sugar and fats and stuff that you don't need. I get it because I love that stuff too, but you can't, you, you can't be seeking that out every single day. And I think a lot of times, and I know I've thought this in the past too, is that people think life is short. I, I want to be happy and I want to eat what I want to eat and I want to have that donut and have that thing because who knows, maybe I'll be dead tomorrow. I'm like, you might be, but one extra donut is not going to make that end of your life any better. Stay the course, stay on your program uh, and figure out what works for you, what you like, plan it into your grocery list, plan on prepping on a specific day of the week and make it a habitual thing. It's that simple. 
Uh, I, I think meal prepping, I don't think I know, meal prepping is an essential part of fitness as it regulates your caloric and your macro intake uh, by having a portion controlled meal that's specific to you, as well as eliminating mostly <laughs> the call to go out to lunch or dinner as you already have it. Going to restaurants for every single meal is not only expensive, but certainly not healthy. You know, given the option, you're always going to choose like the fatty, tasty thing that you know you shouldn't be eating <clears throat> because you tend to hit the fuck it button when you're out in restaurants and stuff, right? You're like, well, I'm here. I may as well get what I want. So ultimately, it, you know, if you have a meal sitting there that's made, you're much more likely to say yes to that, to eat what you've already made. because You don't want to waste your money. You don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste your food. So you're going to eat what you have and, you know, they'll save you from making a bad choice on that day. And some days you might fail. Some days you might say, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with the group. I'm gonna go with my friends, my work colleagues. We're going out to lunch today. Then just keep that meal in your fridge at work or wherever. And you say, tomorrow I'm on my meal. There's no going out. And tomorrow people are like, hey, let's go out. And you're like, I went out yesterday, I can't go again. Those are the small steps that will build towards you making better choices and having better habits. Save your cheat meal, save it for the weekend, you know, and don't use your entire weekend as one big cheat meal because you'll just eliminate all the progress you've made during the week. Don't go crazy. Have your cheat meal or two, don't go nuts. All right, there are many more tips and tricks that I apply for myself uh, in order to stay active, healthy, and pushing towards new goals. Uh, but those are my, my five golden rules, which I live by. Um, those I believe are my top five most important and of course, I have ups and downs, but ultimately, I remain on the path, and so should you. Uh, I know some of you are thirsty for more movie and TV commentary here at Recap Repackaged Wisdom, uh, and there will be much more, uh, so make sure to subscribe, comment, and let me know who or what you'd like to uh, like me to talk to or to cover next. In the meantime, uh, you can catch all of my written reviews uh, and articles on Way of the Shirey on Substack and follow me on Twitter at Arctic Ninja Paul, as well as uh, watch my videos uh, over at the Arctic Ninja Network on YouTube. It's everything Arctic Ninja or Way of the Shirey everywhere. I just can't, I can't narrow down on a name. Now it's Repackaged Wisdom. I just can't stop. But uh, lots more to come here on Repackaged Wisdom, trying to get the momentum back up. So I hope that you stick around. Uh, and continue to look for new episodes. So we'll be working harder to get them out. And I'm also looking to do some breakout episodes too. So maybe uh, cover some more movie and TV news as part of repackaged wisdom or discussions. I don't really want to do news. That's fucking boring. And I'm not interested in doing that anymore. I'm, I have, I've moved on. Uh, deeper dive discussions about movies, TV, comics, and the industry in general are what I would rather cover not some casting news or posters that were just released. You can catch all of that on all the content farms all over the web. As always, uh, I thank you for listening and sharing your time with me. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this episode that will help you on your own fitness journey. So just remember to stay the course and I will see you next time. I'm Paul Shirey with Repackage Wisdom. Mm -hmm.